It is an honor for me to be with you this evening. My name is Johanna Fernandez, and I'm a professor of history at Baruch College of the City University of New York. I'm also a leading member of the movement to bring Mumia home. And uh, this has been a day long in coming, and we are finally here. It's taken a little army of people to pull this together, but we hope to add to the dialogue and political conversations of this morning. I wanna welcome all of you to a teaching titled US Empire and Political Prisoners. Once again, I'm Johanna Fernandez, and the question before us is what's a political prisoner? A political prisoner is someone who's targeted by the state, vilified and imprisoned for their political beliefs and militant organizing against their government and in defense of freedom. Political prisoners are imprisoned because they speak uncomfortable truths and because historically they've sought to expose the root causes of social problems, they also have historically put forth a new vision of how to live uh, and a new way for reorganizing society. Um, you might recall some names of political prisoners. Who are the political prisoners whose names we've heard? Uh, Rosa Parks is one, Martin Luther King, Angela Davis, Leonard Peltier, Mutulu Shakur, Jalil Muntakim, Chelsea Manning, Asada Shakur, Eugene V. Debs, Nelson Mandela, Muhammad Ali, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, Jesus Christ, Oscar Lopez Rivera, Mumia Abu Jamal, and someone many know around the world, Galileo. Our discussion this evening is critical for understanding the relationship between the rise of mass incarceration in the 1980s and the government led campaign of repression, especially against black radicals in the 1960s. And during this period, politicians manufactured a moral panic around crime and law and order to criminalize the urban rebellion of that period but also the organizations and the people who were fighting for freedom in the 1960s. And out of this campaign of political repression against black, brown, and white radicals emerged the largest car carceral project in American history. And then after that campaign of repression was launched against black radicals, brown radicals, and white radicals, in the 1980s, in the context of deindustrialization and the permanent joblessness it produced in cities like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and beyond, the state moved to massively warehouse poor Black Americans and Latino communities that were now deemed economically dispensable under capitalism, but also likely to resist. Of the 2.4 million people in prison today, half were unemployed when they were arrested. And today, Corrections is the third largest employer in the country behind Manpower Inc. and Walmart. Um, we are gathering tonight because it is also the birthday of Mumia Abu Jamal, a political prisoner, uh, an imprisoned radio journalist and former black who was framed by the Philadelphia police and wrongfully accused of killing a white police officer in Philadelphia in 1981. In prison, Mumia disciplined his prose, became a writer of great literary power, and has dedicated his life to writing about those who face abuse at the hands of capitalism and um, to essentially fighting for a better world um, and for fighting for the highest aspirations of humanity. And tonight we celebrate his life, but also the lives of all political prisoners in the United States, in Palestine, in Turkey, in Chile, in South Africa, in Puerto Rico, and the world over. We're gonna hear from a cross section of people in the front lines of struggle today in this COVID-19 moment, including the fierce Donna Robinson of Release Aging Prison, uh, Release Aging People in Prison, 
the fierce Chris Smalls, who's the fired Amazon worker, Alice Walker, Angela Davis, Fred Hampton, BJ Prashad, Mark Lamont Hill, and beyond. I am now going to turn it to our first um, to our first speaker. But before I start, I have to thank Common Notions and Malav um, Z uh, Zanuga, uh, who is critical um, to this project. Um, he's critical to helping us bring this project to fruition virtually this teaching. So I just want to uphold Common Notions, which is the publisher of We Want Freedom, uh, the writings of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Our first speaker, without further ado, is the fierce Megan Malachi. She is a woman known by many organizers to be no nonsense. She is an organizer and founding member of Philly Real Justice, which was founded in 2015 in response to rampant police brutality in Philadelphia and across the country. We welcome Megan Malachi. Thank you so much, Shahana. So I was asked to bring a Philadelphia story um, to light in terms of Mumia Jamal, Abu Jamal, and I want to do that. So I was born in 1981, the same year that Mumia Abu-Jamal was, was falsely incarcerated. Like many Black Philadelphians of my generation, I grew up with the knowledge of both Mumia and MOVE, but I have to say that it wasn't spoken about in most families openly. You would usually hear about it in hushed whispers and behind doors. I graduated from Philadelphia Public Schools, and I don't remember even one teacher talking about Mumia or MOVE. However, I was fortunate enough in 1999 to hear about a huge rally that was going to take place downtown in Philadelphia. And my middle sister and I decided that we were going to take the subway down and go. So the year was 1999 and I was 17 and a senior in high school. I didn't know it at the time, but this march was considered one of the most one of the most poignant and important Mumia rallies that had taken place to date. I remember being really impressed with the many speakers who took an uncompromising stance in their demand for Mumia's freedom. You have to remember in 1999, Mumia was still on death row. Tom Ridge was the fascist governor of Pennsylvania who was actively attempting to murder Mumia. What I remember the most about the march was that the organizers of the rally made it clear to all of us that that was not going to happen. I remember leaving the march feeling super empowered and hopeful, but there was also a lingering fear that I did not understand at the time. I now understand that that fear I was experiencing was the anxiety of finally acknowledging the, precarious, the precariousness of Black life under white supremacy. Two years later, my own family would experience the incarceration of my father. And I further understood what it meant to lose someone you love to the system of mass incarceration. Through this experience, my family and I learned what, how it felt to have your family member removed from prison to prison and have no idea where they are. We learned about the high cost of traveling back and forth to upstate Pennsylvania from Philadelphia. We learned about the high cost of putting money on commissary. We learned about the high cost of prison calls. But even more, we learned about the intimidation that the incarcerated and their family members experience at the hands of prison officials. And these are the things that Mumia and our other incarcerated people are experiencing every day, these violent indignities that leave such an impression on your soul, even once you're released. A week ago, we received a call that Mumia was taken to the hospital with the coronavirus. Thank God that wasn't true. But when Mumia called to speak to the activists and comrades on the call, he said, I'm OK, but I need freedom. I think that Mumia's words can be applied to the millions of incarcerated people who also need freedom. When I think about Mumia, 
I think about the letters that I would receive from my own father and the calls that I re would receive from him where he needed freedom as well. Mumia Abu-Jamal would say that every prisoner is a political prisoner. And I truly believe that because everyone who's incarcerated under this fascist system is being used as an economic ploy to feed this decadent and oppressive system that seems to have no end. I believe it is our duty to struggle and bring them home. And I believe that now is the time more than ever to bring Mumia and all of our incarcerated people home. Free Mumia, free them all. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Megan, for those words. Our next speaker is Janet Africa. Janet Africa was recently released from prison. She's a political prisoner in prison for close to 40 years. And she's one of the powerful women of the Move 9. Janet Africa. On the move. Happy the move. birthday, Mumia. Happy birthday, Mumia. We love you. I just wanted to give people a little story about when we met Mumia. When we were first locked up in 1978, Mumia was one of the first few media people who accurately reported on MOVE, and he was serious about understanding what MOVE was about. And once he heard the teaching of John Africa, he was moved by it, and he internalized it in his own life. That's why you notice he always says, long live John Africa, because he's had a lot of information given to him and he reveres that information and he incorporates it in his life. As a journalist, he covered our trial and did in-depth coverage on MOVE. And at times that left him at odds with his own employers, but he did not stop. He would go in that courtroom and he would watch what went on in that courtroom and judge it fairly and put it out in the news just like it was. He wouldn't slant move side and he wouldn't slant the, the uh, court side. So people got to see the absolute position of what was going on in those courtrooms. And of course, the system didn't like it because they wanted it slanted the way other medias had done to move. Uh, while we were in prison, Mumia came and he visited us. He did interviews. Mumia has supported move for a long time a long time and we support Mumia and we will continue to support Mumia. I've been a political prisoner for 41 years in prison in the bowels of this system for doing something I didn't do, the same as Mumia. And I can't explain in words to people the mistreatment, uh, debasement, how people are treated in prison, prisoners period. But when you are a political prisoner, they deliberately do things to hurt and mess you up as bad as they can because they want to stop that. And that's what they're doing to Mumia. That's what they've been, to, been doing to Mumia. But I want people to understand this. They told us we wasn't getting out of jail ever. We got out after 41 years. They're saying Mumia is not getting out of jail. Use the example of move that they said wasn't getting out and we got out because of the people because of the support that people had behind move and have behind Mumia now we're saying don't stop that pressure don't stop forcing these people to answer for everything they do because you got to understand the reason they got Mumia in, in there is because they feel a lot of pressure from him they feel like that he can move people in a way that they don't want him to be moved so they trying to quiet him, trying to make him sick, trying to kill him. People, everybody, we have made giant steps. You have made giant steps. Look at us, but don't stop. Keep continuing the fight for Mumia. Put pressure on this system. Thank you. I mean, the people, the strategy of John Africa is what got us released. And this is what we need to get Mumia released. It was a victory for us. And we got to continue this victory. Don't let it stop. Demand answers when they come up with those silly things they come up with. 
push them to do what's right, make them qualify why Mumia is still in prison despite his innocence. We are joining all of you that joined to help get us out of prison, to help get Mumia out of prison. And we will not stop. Thank you. On a move. On a move. Thank you. And now we're moving forward. Uh, I want to uh, now welcome a man who's fire. He's a longtime Umia supporter and husband for 50 years of the late people's attorney, a man without compare, Ralph Pointer, again, the husband for 50 years of the late people's attorney, Lynn Stewart. Welcome, Ralph. Well, thank you so much for that. And it's more than a pleasure. It's an honor to be on this program. And you gave a fantastic overview. We heard what the injustice like in person is like from Janet Africa. We understand the purpose of these injustices. And if I may, I would like to continue with this. Some 55, 60 years ago, I met a great organizer, Queen Mother Moore. And one of the things she said to me was, if you are going to continue in this movement, young man, your only reward will be the people you meet. Well, some 60 years later, she's right, and I have met some wonderful people. I'm still meeting the most wonderful people on this planet, the people who are willing to work to make the planet a better place for everyone. And that carries me to what Johanna was saying. What is a political prisoner? Those who saw injustices and worked to correct them and were captured by the oppressor and imprisoned, put in death camps. And let's be very clear, they meant to kill Janet Africa. That's why they said you're never going to get out. They mean to kill the minds of our children by creating what we are witnessing today, one of the ultimate American injustices. They have imprisoned the body of a great teacher, Mumia Abu Jamal. They are attempting to imprison his voice. And that failure is obviated by the existence or the reality of this program. He has become so famous that in the annals of law, he is known as having the Mumia decision, the Mumia exception. There is law, but when it comes to Mumia, the law changes. The law is uh, applied in a negative manner. That's how it, people have been impressed for so long. But it is double negative for Mumia because he is so powerful because he has a voice. He speaks in a manner that people can understand. When he speaks of injustices, you know it because of the way he said it. And I'm forgetting the name of the great American philosopher who said, truth cannot be told in a way that is understood and not be believed. Well, one of the important ways people are oppressed is they never hear the truth. So if they don't know the truth, they cannot act properly. Momia gave us truth in a manner that we can understand it and we believe it. This is why he is in the death camps today, because they don't dare allow him to practice his voice, his speaking, because too many people would learn the truth. But we don't dare to allow them to keep that voice from us. He has written five, six books. And uh, if you read these books, they are wonderful. 
that there's nothing like hearing him, seeing him, touching him, and witnessing him speak on the truth and the evils of America. Thank you very well, much. Happy birthday, Mumia, and thank you for allowing me to participate in this event, honoring one of the greats among us. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ralph. And before we move to our next speaker, I want to correctly pronounce the name of one of the founders of Common Notions, and that is Malav Kanuga. And he has been critical to bringing this project to fruition virtually. We've been up many, many nights trying to crack the puzzle, and he's helped us do that. He's also the editor um, and publisher of Mumia's brilliant We Want Freedom, A Life in the Black Panther Party, which is on sale with Common Notions. And next, we're going to hear from Carrie Alamin, who's the son of Imam Jalil Alamin. Uh, his father is known as Atrap Brown. Uh, that was uh, the name that he was known by in the 1960s. And as you probably know, H. Rap Brown is the legendary Black Power activist who had a law named after him in 1968, literally known as the H. Rap Brown Law. Part of the apparatus of repression uh, launched against Black radicals in the 1960s. Without further ado, Kyrie Alamin. Um, no, thank you. I appreciate the, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's a blessing to be here and uh, I want to, you know, send a special thanks to Mumia because he's always been a supporter of my father and vice versa. Um, we, uh, we cheer and, and celebrate whenever we hear the good news, uh, coming from your side. And I know, you know, even though we have smaller wins on our side that the cheers are just as loud. Um, so we're thankful for that. Um, I kind of just wanted to take this time to, aside from giving thanks, um, bring awareness to the situation and, and where we currently are because we do need assistance. Um, we need support and that's just uh, making noise. That's the kind of support we need. Um, we've been turned away, obviously, on all the levels uh, in the courts, whether it be the federal Supreme Court or the state courts. But uh, recently, the uh, a district attorney here in Fulton County opened up a new unit called the Conviction Integrity Unit. Uh, and the purpose of this unit is to investigate past convictions uh, to see if they were valid. Um, and actually at the, the launching or coronation of this unit, the opening of this unit, they had uh, Andy Young speaking. And at the end of his speech, he turned to the unit and asked them to look into my father's case specifically. Um, the district attorney's response to that was that we had not filed a um, an official request, which we are now working on. But aside from filing an official request with them, which allows us to address everything from the confessions of other people to this crime, um, to the mismatch of, of, of evidence or lack thereof, uh, we can rehash all of those things. We also are starting a change.org petition um, where we'll point out all of these different um, talking points that our reasons for a new trial, if not freedom in total. So we'll have that uh, that petition circulating through social media and uh, and obviously through these networks as well, um, because we need those petitions signed. We need 500,000, a million signatures like, you know, these celebrities get when they're trying to get out of prison. So, you know, it's time for, uh, I think that's an important thing for us to do for all of our political prisoners to start engaging the youth where they are and through the formats that they're that they're engaging in 24 hours a day. We don't put our phones down. Um, and so we have to start meeting them there. We have to meet them on Instagram. We have to meet them on Facebook. Uh, for the younger people like myself, we might have to meet them on TikTok, but we definitely have to meet them there and uh, and get them motivated, just as motivated as they were to get Meek Mill out of prison, to get the people who allowed Meek Mills to exist out of prison. Um, and so as, as everyone always says, free them all and happy birthday, brother Mumia. And um, that's my time, I believe. But uh, you can go to freemanjamil.com or whathappentorap.com, and they both go to the same website, and you can get all the information you need. I'll be updating that website soon and providing a link to the change.org uh, petition. Thank you so very much, 
Kyrie, uh, and I want to just um, really uphold the name of Jamil Alamin, political prisoner. You've just heard his son. His name in the 1960s was H. Rep. Brown. And part of the reason why we're here is because there is an entire generation of political prisoners, activists who challenged the state in the 1960s who are imprisoned today still. They were targeted for their fierce activism. And ultimately, they were targeted for their challenge to American empire during the Vietnam War, but also for civilizing American society. And I like to say often and remember that freeing political prisoners is the moral assignment of our generation, because without the struggles of 60s activists, we would not have the few freedoms we have today. Uh, I want to move on now to our next guest, uh, Nancy Mansour. And the name Nancy Mansour is essentially synonymous with a free Palestine. She is the founding member of Existence is Resistance, a fierce warrior woman, and a friend of the Black Freedom Movement. Nancy. Peace. Um, Thank you, first of all, for having me. Thank you for always giving Palestinians a voice. Um, I'd like to thank every single righteous human that put in time and effort to make this event happen. Whether you're an organizer, a speaker, or a viewer, thank you for caring enough about other humans who have given their life to our freedom. To Mumia Abu Jamal, a humongous happy born day to you. Thank you for existing, resisting, and continuing to do so all these years. To all political prisoners around the world, from Philly to Palestine, on behalf of the entire Existence is Resistance family, we love you and appreciate you and believe in your freedom soon to come. To, in law, <laughs> to law enforcement infiltrating us, bored working at home, our sellouts who might be watching, I'd like to tell you real quick how you've wasted your life working against everything that you should want for your children. To remind you that Mumia Abu Jamal went to jail the year that I was born, and 39 years later, here I am, speaking his name, I'm not from Philly, the same way I will teach my daughter to if he isn't free by the time she's talking. You can lock down the physical, but never the mental. Two days ago, 23-year-old Palestinian political prisoner Noor Jabir al barghouti died in an Israeli prison due to medical neglect. During the month of March, 357 Palestinians have been arrested despite a coronavirus lockdown. At the end of March, there was almost 5,000 political prisoners still being held in Israeli dungeons, 184 of them being children under the age of 18. Many of these prisoners are held with no actual charges. Most are held initially for weeks or months with no legal representation and forced by torture to sign confessions of crimes they did not commit in Hebrew, a language which the majority of them do not speak, read, or understand. Some are held on administrative detention. It's basically a six month holding period while Israel investigates them, renewing this holding period, period every six months for another six months leaving some Palestinians serving over 20 years with no actual charge. I could go on forever with the oppressive, torturous, occupying methods of our oppressors that our oppressors use against us from Palestine to Guantanamo, but I have about a minute left <laughs> and I timed this. And I'm a firm believer in people speaking for themselves. So I reached out to a family friend who was sentenced to 30 years when he was a teenager, Majd Ziada, and he wrote this short message for me to read to you as it was a little too risky for him to try and get on live. First of all, I would like to wish Mumia Abu Jamal a happy birthday. My name is Majd Ziada. I was kidnapped from my home in Ramallah when I was 19 years old in 2002. And on the second of this month, I completed my 18th year in Israeli prisons. I am very glad to take part in this event, which is a good opportunity to focus on the issue of political prisoners. Today, I would like to shed light on the Palestinian struggle for liberation, which is the cause that all Palestinian prisoners fought for in the past and continue to fight for today in Israeli prisons. We as Palestinian prisoners share with you and all the political prisoners the same goals and aspirations, which are freedom and our essential right to resist racism and oppression that we face as indigenous people in Palestine and as oppressed people all over the world. The Israeli occupation defines us as security prisoners in order to deny our existence and to stop us from resisting the colonization of our lives and land. It is also an attempt to distract us from our main goal, to achieve liberation and self-determination. 
On this occasion, I want to emphasize that we will continue our struggle and continue to reinforce our independent Palestinian character, which is opposed to all kinds of injustice and persecution all over the world. And we will continue our path until we achieve all of our legal rights and our priceless freedom. Your brother and comrade Majd. So Majd actually, after having five lawyers and a long fight um, in which his mother passed away a few years ago and he was not allowed to go to the funeral, um, he actually got his sentence reduced to 20 years and he will be out in two years time. If you want to join us for his release, we are going to go to Palestine for that. Um, please keep fighting. We've seen it with our, our sisters, Jeanette. Um, we've seen it with, with Delbert. We've seen it with our brother, Sekou Odinga. They gave their lives, so we can't stop fighting. Everybody will be free. Freedom to all from Palestine to Philly. Thank you so very much, Nancy, for those powerful words. I'll just say that one in five Palestinians have been imprisoned. And I think that the crisis of imprisonment in Palestine pretty much tells the story of the purpose of prisons. Prisons are machines, institutions of social control. Um, and the reason why one in five Palestinians have been in prison at one point in their lives is because these are people massively displaced from their lands by Israel in 1948 who are fighting for freedom. We support them here in the United States. We stand in solidarity with a free Palestine. Free Palestine. Thank you, Nancy. And before we move on, I'd like to welcome all of you to contribute to the conversation that's ha happening online on YouTube and Facebook. We have folks who are lined up to take your comments and we are going to read your comments in a few minutes. So please uh, comment on the program, ask questions, uh, make statements. And next um, to the stage, to the virtual stage is Teresa Gutierrez, Teresa Gutierrez. And Teresa Gutierrez is coming to us from an urgent errand with her mom, who is at a nursing home that's been hit with COVID-19. And she wasn't able to do a mic check earlier because of that. So our heart and um, um, our solidarity is with her in these troubled times. She is a national coordinator of FIRE, Fight for Immigrants and Refugees Everywhere. Teresa has led demonstrations against the Greyhound Bus Company in New York for its cooperation with ICE. Um, and she now lives in San Antonio, Texas, where she continues to organize in defense of migrants and immigrants. Welcome, Teresa Gutierrez. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, happy birthday to our comrade and, and leader, Mumia Abu-Jamal. And thank you for your kind words about uh, my mother. Uh, certainly an important shout out right now has to be to all the PPE workers. I'm so grateful that we know CNAs in our nursing home that are going above and beyond uh, to take care of our, our elders there, which is a dire situation for for everyone, but especially our elders right now. Um, I want to talk very briefly about <clears throat> my experience as an immigrant rights activist and its relationship to the struggle for Mamiya. You know, I was born in Texas, so the issue of immigration is part of our DNA. You know, we often say that I didn't cross the border, the border crossed us in my case, because uh, we were here when Texas was stolen uh, from Mexico. And so when the immigrant rights movement burst to the scene in 2006, it became my main area of work. But back in the day, I was extremely impacted by the black liberation struggle as a young Chicana in Texas. And so the case of Mumia and other uh, liberation activists has always been also part of my DNA. So in 2006, when the immigrant struggle burst into scene and we struggled to uh, defend immigrants day in and day out, May Day was uh, an action that uh, immigrants revived in the United States. There have been many efforts by the Million Worker March uh, and others who had tried to revive May Day and have actions separate from the, the uh, you know, main, mainstream. But immigrants revived May Day in 2006, which was great. It was an important independent action of workers. 
And the main emphasis, of course, was uh, against the deportations for migrant rights and so forth. But I was proud to be part of the immigrant rights um, sector, that movement that very much understood the, the importance of all immigration rallies to bring in other issues, to bring in the issue of wars abroad, to bring in the issues of police terror in black and brown neighborhoods and so forth. And I found it so deeply moving to be in immigration coalition meetings where we had to say, well, you know, there's an important case, uh, Mumia Bujamal, who is a, an activist, and we would have to explain him, you know, 99% of the immigrant activists did not know who Mumia was. But once you broke it down, it was like, oh, okay, we get it, you know. And of course, to Mumia's credit, he would always write um, statements on the immigrant struggle and the May Day struggle, and we were able to share that. And of course, he always wrote about US imperialism in Latin America. So it was very easy for us to make that connection. And you fast forward, of course, to uh, 2016, when uh, Trump, or as we call him, Pendejo, uh, his campaign for presidency was built on an anti-migrant, anti-Mexican hatred. It was a, a, a vicious dog whistle to the reactionaries, to the right wing, to the white supremacists, you know, and he got elected on that basis. Um, and, you know, the war of terror uh, really escalated against immigrants. And the one thing that we have to say that the struggle for migrant rights has in common with that of the struggle of our political prisoners is the tenacity and the inspiration that these sisters and brothers and family give us every single day. There have been deportations, there have been cages, there's deaths, there's sicknesses. There's these caravans that we see of children and young people and our grandparents and men and women and trans people who are walking over 2,000 miles from Central America to come to the border. And we see these very difficult conditions that come out of uh, US imperialism's economic policies and foreign policies. And our hearts break with all of this, but they can throw everything against us but migrants continue to struggle, continue to organize. They are here and they are not going to leave. Just last weekend in, in Los Angeles, there was 200 cars in a car caravan demanding stimulus aid for the undocumented and other low paid workers. And so uh, they may try to cage us, but like Mamiya, we will continue to struggle. Happy birthday, Mamiya, and thank you so much for everything that you stand for. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. Next, we've got Anne Lam. Anne Lam is one of the most consistent fighters uh, in the movement to free political prisoner. In fact, her face is the movement outside of um, the struggle against political imprisonment. And she's also the face behind the Jericho movement in New York. She is the chair of Jericho NYC. And she's been engaged in political activity since 1973. Without further ado, Anne Lam. Well, thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, really an honor to be here, of course. Happy birthday to Mumia. We would love to see him on this side of the wall soon. It's been way too long. I wrote a very short speech because I know I only have three minutes. Uh, the Jericho Movement was formed in 1996 by former political prisoners, Safia Bukhari and Herman Ferguson. I'm sure people remember them well and current BPP BLA political prisoner Jaleel Muntakeen has been working tirelessly ever since to free all US held political prisoners and prisoners of war. We also do international work and have traveled abroad to attend various symposia on the issue of political prisoners, isolation and torture, including Palestine, the Basque country and so on, Turkey. Our political prisoners are some of the most wonderful people I have had the honor to meet in my lifetime. They are all brilliant analysts and former community activists who would serve us all much better on this side of the walls. This is precisely the reason the US government does everything in its power to keep them locked up and isolated from their families, loved ones, and communities. Jericho provides material support to our political prisoners in various forms, including commissary money, food packages for those who can receive them, and legal support in their various efforts to attain their freedom. 
Political prisoner support is an intergenerational struggle. And I want to emphasize that because it's true. As many of our brothers and sisters have been locked up since the 1960s and 70s. Rochelle Sinke McGee, imprisoned since 1963, is probably the longest held political prisoner in the world. Chip Fitzgerald, the longest held Black Panther political prisoner, has been in prison since 1969. Ed Poindexter of the Omaha Two has been in prison since 1970. His co-defendant, Manda Weilanga, died on March 11, 2016. He always maintained his innocence, both men have, and they were clearly framed by COINTELPRO. We can't talk about political prisoners without talking about COINTELPRO. Jericho co-founder Jaleel Muntakim has been in prison since August 28, 1971, when he was 19 years old. He's now 68 years old and has been denied parole 13 times. We're running a campaign to Governor Cuomo requesting commutation of Jaleel's sentence to time served, 48 plus years. Please go to JerichoNY.org for more information because we really have to keep the pressure on Cuomo. American Indian Movement Wara, warrior Leonard Peltier has been in prison since February 6, 1976, when he was illegally extradited from Canada based upon false affidavits. He was framed for the murder of two FBI agents by COINTELPRO and has also always maintained his innocence. These are just some of our political prisoners. We must always remember and fight for all of them, Russell Maroon Schultz, Dr. Matulu Shakur, Bill Dunn, Imam Jamil al Amin, Jan Laman, Sundiata Kohli, a status co-defendant, the Virgin Islands Three, Kamal Siddiqui, and many more. Jericho also supports the eco and animal rights activists currently imprisoned in the U.S. death camps, some serving draconian sentences. Check out our website, thejerichomovement.com, and please take the time to write to some of our comrades behind the walls you may initiate a really beautiful relationship that will enrich your life. Thank we have you. had some victories and many losses. Too many of our brothers and sisters in struggle have gone to the ancestors while inside the walls. We must work together to free them all. Free them all. Thank you so very much, Anne, for your tireless work on political prisoners. Next, we've got Jihad Abdul Mumit. Hey. Jihad Abdul Mumid is a dynamic human being. He's funny and he's an actor. He is also the national chair of the Jericho Amnesty Movement. He is a political prisoner, former political prisoner for 25 years and member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. Jihad. Welcome, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. All power to the people on the move. Happy Hello. birthday, brother Mumia. Yeah. <laughs> so you can hear me up in there, Mumia. <laughs> That's right, brother. You can hear my vibe. I know that. Yes, indeed. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the powerful presence of everybody and, and for the organizers of this event and uh, that the lessons should be learned moving forward, particularly in the nuance of this uh, pandemic, uh, how we must organize and, and how strong we still are in spite of our, our uh, separation because of this uh, pandem pandemic. So my top salute to uh, Sister Johanna and all concern and how we're moving forward. So I just wanted to uh, make some comments behind my dear sister, Ann uh, Lamb, who spoke just a minute ago. I am the chairperson of the Jericho Movement. Um, but every celebration, our birthday celebrations, uh, when we're dealing with our comrades in the struggle, our political prisoners, our freedom fighters, and for each other, our celebration should be a mark of encouragement to move forward, it should be a call to action. And just be note that every time that we recognize, every time that we acknowledge a political prisoner, this is the most strongest and the most profound connection that we have with our roots in the past in this country. Mm. You know, it is the most profound connection we can have with any movement and it is the thrust that we need in moving forward. So when we recognize Mumia, we are recognizing the importance of our education and our articulation, because we know that that brother is profound in his articulation, he was a journalist, and every time his pen goes to paper, we listen and we learn. When we recognize Brother Mutula Shakur, we recognize how important it is for us to control our own health and be in control of the infrastructure that can keep us healthy and strong environment, because we know that he was an acupuncturist, and I did say, Dr. Matulu Shakur. We recognize Imam Jamil al -Amin. We're recognizing the whole civil rights movement, you know, in this country from SNCC, 
you know, to the Black Panther Party. When we recognize Jalil Abdul Muta King, we're recognizing the Black Panther Party and his ability to organize even from behind the walls. When we recognize Leonard Peltier, that's our connection with our indigenous groups. When we recognize Marcel Maroon Schultz, we recognize the courage and strength it takes to even get out from behind those walls, even if you have to crawl under the wall. And all power to my brother, Russell Maroon Schultz, because it's not a matter it's not a matter of necessarily of our innocence and guilt. It is a matter of us supporting our freedom fighters and standing for our independence. And, and if we recognize brothers like Juan Lyman and, and, and David Gilbert, we recognize all people from all organizations, the weather on the ground, and all movements, we must coalesce together in this movement uh, to be free. Recognizing our political prisoners is recognizing our freedom and ability for us to stand for our own independence. So I salute everybody. You have my heart clenched love and respect. This is the first day of Ramadan. Salam alaikum to all the Muslims out there. And Mumia, I expect to see you next Ramadan. I'm gonna be sitting there breaking fast with you, my dear brother. All power to the people. Thank you, Brother Jihad. All power to the people. And I wanna definitely uphold the name of Russell Maroon Schultz, a fierce revolutionary imprisoned in Pennsylvania a fierce political strategist. I had the honor of visiting him in prison at SCI Green. And next, I'm going to hand it over to our next fierce host, Betsy Piet, who's been critical to the organization of this virtual event. I'll see you soon. I want to uh, wish Mumia a happy 66th birthday and welcome you all to Philadelphia. Um, we planned about nine months ago or, 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 or more that we would have major events here this weekend for Mamiya's 66th birthday. We were going to have 66 events for Mamiya. Um, as things turn out, we're discovering new technologies that we all are getting more and more used to. And um, I think it's been a big boost for us because it means that we can have a global connection uh, that's always been there for Mamiya's movement and we can all be in the same place at the same time, even if it's a virtual space. So we're gonna keep using this. Um, I'm glad that uh, Megan mentioned the uh, March in 1995 for Mamiya. Actually, that was, I was involved in organizing that event. So it's really good to know that uh, young people like Megan was at the time were influenced by that event to the extent that they stayed in the movement and now today's leaders. So it's really wonderful to have that connection. Um, I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Betsy Piet. I'm a managing editor of Workers World uh, newspaper. Uh, I have been a member of International Concerned Family and Friends for decades and also a recent organizer with mobilization from Romania. So it's really uh, a pleasure to be part of this group. Uh, here in Philly, we see Mumia as Philly's native son. This is really, you know, I think his case has been so instrumental to the city, uh, so instrumental to the movement. And it's really helped, I think, the spirit and the fight back of both the struggle to bring Mumia home and the successful struggle to bring the Move 9 home is what has inspired so many young activists who are with us in the movement today. Uh, and we look forward to that more and more. I don't know if you can see in the picture behind me, but there's a lot of young people who have been coming out to recent events from on here. Um, I also, before I introduce our next speaker, and I hope Pam is on. Do we have Pam on? Um, I want to give a shout out to an organization in Philadelphia that if we were actually meeting in person, um, you know, on Friday night, they would be providing food for us. And that's the organization of Food Nut Bomb Solidarity. Cindy Liu and all of the crew who volunteer with her, who have been so critical and instrumental in making this movement happen. Um, you know, the movement, uh, we need the energy, we need the food to keep us going along with the wonderful camaraderie. So thank you again uh, to Cindy and to Food Nut Bomb Solidarity. And again, to remind people as Johanna did to please donate. Uh, we will, I think, be hosting the events that are going on for the rest of this weekend, including an Instagram dance party tomorrow night and a 24 hour poetry in motion um, event. Something about being in Philadelphia, you know, Pam Africa, uh, affectionately known as Mama Pam to most of the community here, is a force to be reckoned with. 
She is the uncompromising Minister of Confrontation of the MOVE organization and the political encyclopedia and fierce mother of the international movement to bring Mumia home and the founder of International Concerned Family and Friends for Mumia. So Pam, if you're with us, take it away. Okay, on the move, I was saying that it's a must that political prisoners, revolutionary-minded people everywhere communicate with each other and understand the power, the urgency of unity. I want to say happy birthday, Mumia, and um, we're celebrating the resistance of, you know, Mumia and all the people that's on this line. I want to take a minute and explain to people what John Africa taught us. And, uh, um, you know, while our work is, my work is so important, while our work is so important, it's our position that finally all our situations are the same because it all comes down to one thing, the oppressor waging an all-out war against any resistance by the oppressed. It's no different than what the oppressor has done to resistors historically, just to name a few, John Brown, Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Pedro Campos, and many, many more, the Black Panthers, the, um, the underground, the weather underground, you know, we must never, we must never ever let our oppressor, our enemy, the real criminal convince us that resistors, freedom fighters, or the oppressed are criminal and belong in prison. How can oppressed people be convinced that Leonard Peltier belongs in prison, that he's a criminal, he's a murderer, when the people saying this are directly involved in stealing his whole country, murdering, slaying, raping, robbing, killing his people into virtual extension? Even till this very day on reservations, how can oppressed people be convinced that Mumia Abu Jamal should be executed? And, uh, and I say executed, and it's not a mistake because that's their plan for Mumia through um, medical neglect, execute him. The act through the, and his co-conspirators that murdered my family, 11 black men, women, and children, and he still walks the street? John Africa has taught us that oppressed people must never, must never side with this system, the oppressor, over, over our oppressed sisters and brothers. We must be very clear on who our enemy is, no matter who our enemy is, no matter what the situation, and it's not each other. How could an inmate ever side with an enslaving-ass prison official over another inmate? How could indigenous people of this land ever side with the oppressor over uh, Native Americans, the oppressed of this land? How could an African slave ever side with the slave master? And you can go on and on and on. But I'm saying today, and you know, it's a historical 66th birthday of Mumia, of resistors on the line and resistors that are, um, that are listening. On the move, long live John Africa, long live the spirit of resistance. Happy birthday, Mumia. Thank you, Sister Pam. Um, it's always a pleasure to share a program with you. Um, Thank you. On the move. On the move. Okay, our next speaker, I actually got to meet our next speaker, Bob Boyle, watching him in action in the court in Scranton, Pennsylvania, when he successfully fought for the right for Mamiya and all prisoners in Pennsylvania to receive medication for hepatitis C. Um, Bob uh, reminded us when we asked him for an intro that um, he's the only white boy on this panel, uh, but he is the John Brown of the legal world who has dedicated his life to the legal defense and freedom of political prisoners. Bob, please tell us how political prisoners, you, about the political prisoners you defended and freed. Thank you. Yes, I've been fortunate enough to represent not only Mumir and his hepatitis C suit, but um, secured the freedom many years ago now of Daruba bin Wahad and many years after that of Marshall Eddie Conway. But in the in the few minutes that I have that I have, I'd like to address some of the barriers that prevent political prisoners from getting justice in the courts. 
Many of our political prisoners receive life sentences in, case, in cases involving the deaths of police officers. It is extremely difficult to win a new trial for anyone convicted of a murder, let alone where there is a death of a police officer and the case has political overtones. In the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, all these things came together. He was a member of the Black Panther Party who fought against police violence and other forms of misconduct. In the trial of Mumia, like the trials of so many Black Panther Party prisoners, such as Marshal Eddie Conway and Daruba bin Wahad and Elmer Geronimo Pratt, the state suppressed evidence of innocence and fabricated evidence of guilt. Now, 40 and 50 years later, when political prisoners seek freedom through the courts or through the parole boards, police unions, such as the Fraternal Order of Police, and here in New York, where I am, the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, the PBA, wage vicious and sensational campaigns in the media opposing new trials or opposing parole. These campaigns have the effect in many cases of intimidating judges and or members of the parole board who might otherwise fairly consider the legal issues before them. Of course, the police union's efforts also have a political motivation. They have the motivation to rewrite and criminalize the struggles for freedom and self-determination waged by organizations such as the Black Panther Party, such as the Young Lords in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The message to youth, particularly youth of color, is that if their message to the youth, and particularly the youth of color, is that if you embrace the politics of organizations such like, as the Black Panther Party, you will end up in jail and we will try to see to it that you stay in jail for the rest of your life. So part of our effort to free political prisoners is not just in the courts. We must take on the power of the police unions. So-called King's Bench petition in Mumia's case, brought by Maureen Faulkner in the FOP, is just an example of this power. Here in New York, the PBA is trying to put former political prisoner Herman Bell back in jail by intervening in a court proceeding that's challenging the, the grant of parole. In addition to fighting these efforts in the courts, elected officials must be held accountable when they cave in to police union pressure. There must be also a renewed effort to demand community control of the police, just like the Black Panthers did in the late 1960s. So I wanna say in closing, happy birthday to Mumia and free Mumia and all political prisoners. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Our next speaker, um, Kyle Frazier, is probably better known to the movement as TAG. Uh, he is a sharp as a tag organizer and a linguist with the campaign to bring Maria home and the incarcerated workers organizing committee. And I had an opportunity to hear about IWAC from a prisoner who told us to call and report information we were getting from prisoners about the COVID-19 uh, um, incidents in their prisons. So welcome tag. Uh, I'm honored to be in dialogue with this a nerve-wrackingly uh, distinguished panel discussing this pivotal question on this Mumia's 66th born day. 66 was the year that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was founded. As we're celebrating the birth of its Philly chapters, former Minister of Information, with so many Panthers and members of the broader Panther family present, let me draw from that revolutionary legacy as I'm so often compelled to for guidance in grappling with this question. Bobby Seale, while speaking at a Chicago chapter gathering in the late 60s, 
quotes Huey P. Newton's definition of power as the ability to define phenomena and make them act in a desired manner. This emphasizes not only the fundamental importance of our active participation in defining reality, but also that this mode of defining is necessarily an ongoing process. The conditions of political imprisonment at and around the time Bobby Seale uttered those instructive words, despite important continuities such as the outrage of so many prisoners of war from that period remaining captive to this day, have changed significantly with the shifts and upheavals marked by the last century, the last half century. And to connect around what political imprisonment is demands that we have a shared sense of what we mean by the political. For example, is slavery political? It is largely thanks to the efforts of political prisoners, some of whom are a part of this very teaching, that legalized enslavement as an ongoing reality within US prisons is known even to the degree that this long silenced constitutional clause is known, let, al let alone acknowledged and reckoned with in the enormity of its implications. Given the cruel fact of carceral slavery in a country founded on genocide and enslavement, the political character of US imprisonment is profound and unavoidable and the ableist, gendered, racist, and generally oppressive nature of the settler colonial project that is U.S. imperialism reserves its vilest, most barbaric manifestations for those ensnared in its countless cages domestic and abroad. So when here in NY, for example, sisters and brothers from some of our most oppressively neglected communities are targeted by the scores and even upward of 100 at a time, for racist class warfare under the guise of so-called gang raids, their imprisonment is far from apolitical. It is circumstances like these, no doubt, that brought an inside organizer and close comrade to assert to the brothers he was building with inside that they too, not just himself, are political prisoners, prisoners of war. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Salute all right. to you all. all right. All right. Okay, um, our next speaker uh, is Gloria Rubek, a leader of the Texas Death Row Abolitionist Movement and a longtime supporter of MOMIA and active in immigrant solidarity work in Houston, Texas. I just want to, I remember um, Gloria and a busload of people from Texas coming all the way up to Philadelphia uh, for the mobilization, the millions from MOMIA. Uh, event that we had here in the late 1990s. So welcome back to Philly, Gloria. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, greetings from the state of Texas, home to the largest prison system in the United States and the death penalty capital of the country. Um, the executions here in Texas, we're now up to 658 people that have been legally lynched by the state of Texas. But first of all, I want to give my greetings to our brother Mumia Abu-Jamal on his 66th birthday and say happy birthday to you. As an activist who grew up in the 60s and 70s, people like Mumia, people, all of the sisters and brothers in the Black Panther Party were such an inspiration to me as a young revolutionary. And to read year after year, decade after decade, that some of these Panthers are still locked up. That's an indictment of this system. It proves the illegality of this system we live under that could do something like this. And it's not just the Panthers or Mumia, but our brother Leonard Peltier, the Puerto Rican political prisoners, uh, Imam Jalil El Al Amin, and thank heavens, I don't have to say the move nine anymore. But we live under a system that doesn't give a damn about us and locks up more people than any other country on this planet. I'm humbled to be a part of this teaching today. And um, I just want to set the political prisoners to know what an inspiration you are. Um, 
I dedicate my words today to my friend and comrade on Texas death row, Harvey T. Irvin, who I met back in 1988 when he asked me to come visit him so he could ask me to witness his execution. Fortunately, he is still alive and I still visit him, but he became a revolutionary activist on death row and in fact formed a group called Pure, Prisoners United for Revolution, I mean Panthers United for Revolutionary Education. Um, so I'll just close by saying what uh, the late Kwame Ture always said, y'all, we got to organize, organize, organize. So free Mumia, tear down the walls, and free them all. Thank you. Woohoo! Thank you, Gloria. Uh, it's always great to hear from you. Welcome, uh, Benjamin Ramos, um, who, Rosado, um, uh, I'm told he is a lover of food and liberation. Uh, ben Ramos Rosado organizes, educates, and mobilizes for many revolutionary causes. He is the leader of Pro Libertad and a fierce defender of political prisoners. Welcome, Ben. Thank you so much, Betsy. On behalf of the Pro Libertad Freedom Campaign and the Puerto Rican diaspora in New York City, I want to thank all the organizers of today's panel for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to share in the love and solidarity of one of our greatest heroes, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Second, I want to echo all the sentiments of prior speakers in saying, Feliz cumpleaños, Mumia. Happy birthday to Mumia. Let me just begin very briefly with a quick update. This past February, Nina Dros Franco, one of our Puerto Rican political prisoners, was set free and is now with her family. You can see her on my right, I believe. And um, in about a year and a half, Puerto Rican prisoner of conscience, Ana Belen Montes, will be freed as well. So that puts Pro Libertad in a very interesting position as a political prisoner campaign. And in reorganizing our work plan, we've been thinking about you know, prioritizing solidarity and work with all US held political prisoners, in particular Mumia. And that's why today I'm very honored to announce that on Mumia's 66th birthday, Pro Libertad is reactivating, relaunching, and revitalizing a project that's always been near and dear to our heart, and that is Latinexes for Mumia. As Latinexes for Mumia, this project of Pro Libertad will focus on educating within the Latinx communities of New York City around Mumia's case. We also plan on working working as closely as we can to all the New York City-based Mumia campaigns and solidarity uh, collectives. And of course, we're going to be supporting all the international and national initiatives that come from Philadelphia on, on Mumia's behalf. Um, the Mumia movement was instrumental in freeing the Puerto Rican political prisoners. That's a bit of history that's often kind of erased and ignored. The Mumia movement has always stood hand in hand in solidarity with my community, the Boricua community, in calling for the release of our political prisoners. So we are going to pay that forward. I think Mumia's, the best gift we can give Mumia on his birthday is one of solidarity and action. So we look forward to working with all of the forces that exist, hopefully soon face to face and not just on this electronic community, but you know, cara a cara, people to people, face to face, and really uplift, support, and build the movement that Mumia needs to free him. It's our hope that next year on his 67th birthday, all of us are in Philadelphia supporting that birthday, celebrating that birthday together with our free comrade. So I leave it at that brief and to the point. We've got a lot of work to do mm -hmm. and we're going to be standing side by side with all of our comrades in doing that. So libertad para Mumia, feliz cumpleaños Mumia, free them all. Thank you very much. Y para Puerto Rico también. Y para Puerto Rico, como siempre. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Ben, and uh, libertad por Puerto Rico uh, soon in our in our lifetime. We hope. I was told in one of the comments uh, earlier tonight, someone asked whether Mumia was still in prison, um, and you know we we learn a lot that a lot of people do not know as much about Mumia's case as we should make sure they know. Uh, we want to draw you know, people's attention to an important website, Mobilization for Mumia, that's a numeric four. There is a ton of background history on Mumia's case. It's also an area you can donate on. Uh, also to the Campaign to Bring Mumia Homes website. And uh, there was another one in New York, which unfortunately I don't have in front of me, 
Um, the Free Mamiya Coalition, I believe that's a long-standing organization that's been supporting Mamiya. I'm going to turn this over to Santiago Alvarez, who's on the opposite coast from us. So welcome, Santiago. Thank you, Betsy. Happy birthday, Mumia. We love you dearly, and we hope that we'll all be celebrating with you in person this time next year. My name is Santiago Alvarez. I'm a UC Santa Cruz undergraduate student where Mumia is currently taking graduate courses with Professor Fernandez. I'm an organizer with Anak Bayan, the youth sector of the grassroots movement fighting to obtain national democracy and liberation in the Philippines, and have been organizing with the People's Coalition and COLA for All uh, with the graduate student, undergraduate student, and worker struggle on the UC Santa Cruz campus, commonly known as COLA, for which Mumia has also shared his solidarity and support. So I've been lucky enough to grow up in a family and community here in the Bay Area of longtime Mumia supporters who have brought my sister, my cousins, and I out to rallies, protests, and concerts for Mumia growing up. And I'm so grateful to have Mumia and other powerful freedom fighters like Pam and others as guiding forces in my life. And I'm very humbled and honored to be a part of this program. So I want to remind everybody um, that you're able to donate to this movement at the Eventbrite link that you use to register. And that's also where you can find Mumia's book, We Want Freedom, A Life in the Black Panther Party, which is published through Common Notions book, uh, Common Notions books. So I've got Chris Smalls up next. So I'm going to introduce Chris Smalls. Um, so Chris has worked for Amazon for the past five years, but he was fired last month when he decided to stand up and fight to protect his coworkers from COVID-19. After multiple employees tested positive for COVID-19 in the warehouse, Chris organized a temporary walkout and shutdown of the company's warehouse in Staten Island. And this brought national attention to the importance of protecting essential workers in the era of COVID. He is one of the many organizers who is bringing back the fierce power of the working class. His solidarity with Mumia today is a reminder of the need to decarcerate and protect those who are most vulnerable in this age of COVID. Thank you for joining us, Chris. Thank you for having me. Um, first off, uh, free Mumia. Happy birthday, Mumia. Uh, free them all. Um, I just want to say it's an honor to be here um, celebrating this event tonight, um, to be on the phone, uh, the call with uh, all these prominent people. It's an honor. And uh, those watching at home, I hope everybody's uh, safe and well and um, safe and sound with their families. Um, this event tonight is uh, very special to me. Um, just being a young black uh, African-American man, uh, being a father of three. Um, my father, my father um, is incarcerated himself uh, majority of my life. Um, I was born in uh, 1988, and uh, my father is presently uh, serving some time. And um, throughout my course of my life, uh, he wasn't there for me. Uh, my mother, uh, Dawn Smalls, she raised me, um, and she always uh, kept uh, good fathers, good African American men um, around me in my life for me to look up to. Um, it's hard being a single parent out here. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that we always have to, uh, be awake about the fact that, uh, growing up, uh, without a father as a black man, um, is very crucial to us. Um, if you, it's very easy for us to, to turn the wrong way and go down the wrong path, um, uh, to make the wrong decisions. And if, if you don't have the right person around you, you don't have the right people around you, um, your life can be taken away from you. So um, this event tonight is very special to me. Um, Mumia um, is living through me right now, and I'm living through him. Um, we want to be together and stay together and show uh, unity as a culture. Um, this culture uh, has been... Uh, centuries going through so much pain and so much grief um, because they see us um, lesser than what we are. And um, 
oppressors like that, they like to see families, uh, especially black families, separated. And being a, a young black father myself, um, the one promise I made to myself was that I was always going to be there for my children. And um, no matter what um, I go through in my life, um, I try to make sure that I provide and be there for my children because I know how much it means for them to see their father. Um, and, and I know how much it means for a young black man to have his father in his life um, off the simple fact that I didn't have my father in my life. Um, my mother made sure that I had somebody to look up to uh, till this day. And um, what I did for my people um, at uh, my former job in Amazon, uh, sticking up for them, um, is something I have no regrets about. Uh, it's 5,000 people in that building um, that goes in and out weekly. And uh, Amazon hires uh, from urban areas from urban areas, every building that they have in, major, in every major city, um, in every state is in the urban area or close to or nearby. That's where they hire from. 75% of their workforce is African-American or black and brown. Um, so me sticking up for the people, the, the voices that are unheard, um, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And I still feel that way. Um, you could kind of say I started the revolution of the new, uh, the new century, the new decade. And uh, I believe I did as well because uh, others have been uh, following suit and speaking up and uh, reaching out for help as well. And uh, I know for a fact that uh, I save a lot of minorities from um, what this company was trying to do to us. Um, and I still feel that way. And uh, just being um, being able to do this now and being here tonight to celebrate Mumia um, is, is, is very special to me. And it gives me the strength and courage that I need to uh, continue this fight. Because um, I have a long fight ahead of me, a long road ahead of me. And um, it's going to be a challenging road. And I need the strength the prayers, um, the support from everybody here tonight, including Mumia. And um, I, I hope that uh, he understands that uh, he's living through us and we are him. So uh, I just want to say thank you guys for having me tonight. And I hope everybody stays safe, and sell, uh, safe at home. And um, let's pray and get through this together. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks. Woohoo! Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so our next speaker, Susie Abulhawa, is a Palestinian-American human rights activist, political commentator and essayist, award-winning novelist, and biologist. She's the author of two international best-selling novels, Mornings in Jenin and The Blue Between Water and Sky. Thank you for joining us, Susie. Thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Is it working? Yes, yes thank you. Um, so first of all, happy birthday to Brother Mumia and uh, Ramadan Karim to all. Uh, I want to use my time to give a status on uh, Palestinian political prisoners. Israel is currently holding about 5,500 political prisoners, of whom approximately 200 are children and more than 500 are being held uh, without uh, being charged with a crime, as Nancy Mansour already spoke about. Um, one of the more high-profile cases is Randa Jarrar, who's been in and out of prison for the past five years uh, without charge or trial. She's, she has underlying medical issues, and her family knows nothing of her current condition. Um, Israel is the only country in the world that routinely arrests children, denies them access to their parents or attorneys, and puts them through a military tribunal that has a 99.8% conviction rate. This is done only to Palestinian children. Jewish, their Jewish counterparts have separate civil courts complete with civil rights. And despite the pandemic, Israel has actually increased its arrest of Palestinian children in the past two months. In recent years, Congresswoman Betty McCollum introduced legislation to prohibit US tax dollars from funding the torture of Palestinian children. 
And in response, APAC, Israel's biggest lobby in Washington, took out an ad that suggested Betty McCollum was a threat, a greater threat to the United States um, than ISIS. Although Israel has released hundreds of uh, Jewish Israeli prisoners, they have refused to do the same for Palestinian political prisoners, despite calls from human rights groups to release the vulnerable and elderly prisoners. Furthermore, Israel instituted a near complete blackout of information surrounding the status of Palestinians in their prisons. Um, we do know that one Palestinian, 23-year-old uh, Nur Jabir al-Barghouti, died in an Israeli prison uh, the day before yesterday after he collapsed in his cell following medical neglect. Adding insult to injury, Israel is continuing its night raids, kidnappings, and arbitrary arrests in the occupied West Bank. Uh, they also demolished a pop-up hospital tent that was being used to treat patients, and they raided a clinic in East Jerusalem that was testing Palestinian residents who have not had access to testing as their Jewish counterparts, despite paying the same taxes in the city. Let me close by, by tying Israel's prison system with the United States. In addition to the well-known cooperation and training between U.S. police and Israeli occupation military forces, Israel, through its lobbies in the U.S., helps to push through domestic legislation that helps to fill our prisons and subvert civil rights here. here. Um, one little known example is the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which became known as the Secret Evidence Act because it allowed the use of secret evidence, which is straight out of Israel's playbook, to detain and deport lawful U.S. residents in the United States. Bill Clinton signed this into law in the wake of the Oklahoma City bombing, which was perpetrated by a white man, Timothy McVeigh, but this law almost exclusively targeted Arabs and Muslims. My father was one of those targets. He languished in an INS detention center along with hundreds of others who were rounded up in 96 and deported. But my father, who was born in Jerusalem, could not be deported to his homeland. He was one of many, um, including other Palestinians as well as Iraqis, who could not be deported anywhere and languished for years in detention until some country would accept them. The crime bill one-upped and eclipsed uh, uh, was was one-upped and eclipsed by this act, which was again one-upped and eclipsed by the Patriot Act. This mass destruction of lives and the silencing of the freest voices are done incrementally like that. Um, and whether in Palestine or the U.S., it's all part of the same imperial white supremacist fabric. Um, so on the move, free Mumia, free, free them all. Thank you. Primumia, Primal, thank you. And from Palestine, from Palestine to the Philippines, we say stop the US war machine. And thank you for that message of international solidarity. So our next speaker is Laura Whitehorn, a former political prisoner and powerful political analyst. She has dedicated her life to the freedom of all political prisoners. She is the abolitionist with release aging people in prison or rap and the author of The War Before, about the life of Safiya Bukhari, Laura Whitehorn. Happy birthday, Mumia. And before I do anything else, just because I'll get in trouble if I don't say it, David Gilbert asked me to say love, admiration, and solidarity. Um, I'm, this is so terrific, this thing tonight. And one of the most important things I think that the movement to support political prisoners and political prisoners in the United States have done is build solidarity with Palestine. I want to say that there's an organization based in DC, which has a very active uh, human rights program, including uh, a lot of stuff about incarceration. It's called the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. And it's a Zionist organization whose stated goal is to rebuild the alliance between the black community and Jews in order that existed during the civil rights movement in order to build support for Israel. So be on the lookout. And if they ask you to speak someplace, don't do it. So I think this is a, this is an amazing evening. And um, I think it, it just reminds us why, you know, Susan's going to speak later. I know Linda Evans, our other co-defendant is on um, watching this, is why we always called ourselves not just political prisoners, not just North American political prisoners, but anti-imperialist political prisoners, because 
what we understand from, from our solidarity with Palestine and from the international world is that a white settler colony like the United States has the same patterns of incarceration and repression as a white settler colony called Israel that took away the land of the Palestinians. And um, I now do do work with, and I know Donna Robinson, my dear comrade, will be on later from Release Aging People in Prison. And one of the reasons that we do this project is because we understand that what happened between the 70s when some of us were active and moved by the Black Panther Party and acted in solidarity with the Native American movement and the, Latin, the Latinx movement um, is that after the government instituted COINTELPRO and locked up so many of our leaders, some of whom are still inside, and can we just add the name of Kamau Siddiqui to those who have been named tonight and Baranza Bowers and Matulu Shakur, um, who are still inside, who were part of those powerful movements, it wasn't enough for the United States to destroy the actual movements for liberation and the, the organizations. Then they had to try to destroy the communities. And that's why we saw when we first went to prison in 1985, um, we were in women's prisons. By the time we left, those prisons were packed to the gills with women because the rate of incarceration of women had risen by 800% in those years. And right now we're facing this horrible crisis of, and it's going on for Palestinian prisoners, it's going on uh, for prisoners in this country, which is the COVID virus. We know that there's no social distancing in prison. And we all have to work together to try to save the lives of all of our comrades and all of the elders who are in prison. And I want to say the, the movement for political prisoners, the concept of political prisoners is for prisoners and they know a mentor and a leader when, um, when they meet one. And that's why there is a total unity between the movement to release aging people in prison and the movement for political prisoners, for the freedom of all political prisoners. Some of us, when we were working with the Panthers, we started with prison justice Thank and that you, no black person should be put in prison because of the nature of white supremacy in this country. And so that is what the movement to abolish prisons comes back to. Yes, yes. And just Thank the last so thing much, I want to say is that, oh, yeah. um, you know, happy birthday, Mumia, and also happy birthday, Eddie Conway, whose birthday was yesterday, his sixth out of prison. And I want to call up some people who can't be with us, whom I think of when I think of Mumia. And one of them is Alan Berkman, who did time with Mumia. And another is our, our dear lost co-defendant, Marilyn Buck. And another is Nahanda Abiodun. And another is um, Robert Seth Hayes. And another is Mujahid Farid. And these are only the people who have died in the last few years. There are so many more. So yeah. happy birthday, and we all will work together. The other day I heard uh, our right. comrade um, Rabab Abdul Hadi, when she was asked about why isn't there more unity between the, the Palestine organizations in this country, and, and I'm so she sorry, said it Laura, doesn't matter. We We're all fighting for on. the same goal. You have different organizations, different personalities, different characters, but we're all working together. At the Thank end you. of this COVID crisis, when we come out, we will come out fighting because we are sticking together and yeah. we're seeing each other and we're reaching across the world and across the walls. So thank you so much for including me in this. All right. Thank you Free for bringing those names in. Free them all. So our next guest Woo! is going to be um, Susan Rosenberg. Susan Rosenberg is quietly fierce um, and a force to be reckoned with. Uh, they are a former political prisoner and professor of sociology at Hunter College. She is the author of the breathtaking book, American Radical, A Political Prisoner in My Own Country. Thank you for joining us today, Susan. Uh, hi, hello, everybody. Um, OK, well, on the move. Uh, and um, thank you to all the people organizing this. It's really a, a wonderful thing. Um, and I want to say happy birthday. Happy birthday to Mumia. Um, we celebrate you. We celebrate your life. We celebrate your resistance. And we celebrate your never ending solidarity. Um, I, I, I want to say that Mumia and MOVE has given all of us leadership in how to resist in fighting U.S. imperialism and in fighting 
in prison and being in prison um, and giving us leadership uh, around being a political prisoner. Um, when I was in Lexington, Kentucky prison in the 1980s, uh, Mumia wrote a, a really incredible article about it then and called it out, named it for being torture and for what it was. Um, and several years later, when Mumia was facing death on death row in 1995, political prisoners around the country went on hunger strike in solidarity with him. And so there is this long hidden history uh, of solidarity. And I, I think we need that solidarity now more than ever before, as this pandemic has hit all of us, our friends and our families in prison, more people are making demands on the system than uh, ever before in, in some ways. Um, but demands that are really, that have been on the table since the Attica rebellion, right? These are not that new demands. There are new demands in terms of health and in terms of uh, care, but really the fundamental human rights that need to be addressed are the demands that are going on now. Um, but uh i think what i want to say about that is that with these very minuscule releases that are happening as a result of our movement and the larger reform movement um that we we have to put the demands of the names of our political prisoners front and center in all of these efforts that are going on whatever in every way that we can because if we can, then maybe we can pry the prison door open for if it's individual by individual, right? These are people that we just must hold up and fight for. The PPs from the 60s and 70s and 80s, and specifically the ones, and people have mentioned them a lot already, Jihad and Anne and Laura, who are in federal prison, um, have some of these immediate possible avenues to get out. These prisoners include um, uh, Bill Dunn, Leonard Peltier, Laurenza Bowers, Sundiata Akoli, and Dr. Matulu Shakur. Um, and just to specifically say, since I got out of prison, I've been working to get Matulu Shakur, Dr. Shakur, working on his situation and for his Thank release. Um, well, if I, if I can't really talk about him, I want to just say go to matulushakur.com. It's very important to support our compassionate relief and parole efforts for him right now. And when I spoke to him the other day on the phone, he wanted me to say, free Mumia, free all the political prisoners. You know, that was his concern as much as his own personal concern. So thank you very much. Happy birthday, Mumia. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Susan Rosenberg, for those updates and for that message from Matulu Shakur, um, Tupac's stepfather and radical revolutionary. I'll briefly introduce Donna. Um, Donna Robinson is a member of RAP, Releasing Aging Pri People in Prison, and her daughter is serving a lifetime in prison. Her loving support of Mumia links to the larger movement of decarceration, beginning with the respectful return of our elders to their families and communities. So everybody, please welcome Donna Robinson. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am the Western New York organizer for Release Aging People in Prison, RAP, Laura Whitethorn, as well as Kathy Boudin, are my comrades and my most avid supporters. Uh, as you alluded to, I am the mother of a daughter who is serving a 15 to life sentence at Bedford Hill. Up until February 5th, I was the mother of a son and a daughter. They were both being held hostage in New York State. My son returned home on February 5th. He has gotten employment, bought a car, and returned back into society as the young man that I knew I birthed. I want to start by just wishing uh, Brother Mumia happy leveling up day. Uh, both of us are children of the 50s, and that was a time of uh, civil rights, 
Nothing really has changed in these 66 years. Uh, in the 70s, I was in high school. A lot of people who are on this panel tonight and a lot of people you're talking about, I kind of grew up with them vicariously. And uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to Brother uh, Ralph Pointer because he said something so prophetic. Since I've been an advocate for people who cannot speak for themselves, I've met so many wonderful people. Robert Seth Hayes, formerly incarcerated Black Panther member, he's my he was my best friend here in Buffalo, New York, where I reside. Uh, right up until his passing, we would talk occasionally. I was born and raised in New Jersey in a place that's a borough. It's not even a city or a town. And Brother Bashir Hamid went to high school with my uncle and my mother. His name was James York back then. So somehow I am vicariously connected to this movement to free our elders. It's inconscionable to think that people have been incarcerated as long as I have been out of high school. I, you know, I can't even wrap my mind around it. My heart goes out to all of the political prisoners, all of the prisoners who are incarcerated during this pandemic time. And it's, I, I can't function like I would like to because I'm used to going to visit my daughter. The visits are cut off. I have to rely on a phone call once a day as they're being locked in. They're not being transparent with information. This has become very expensive trying to maintain a loved one behind bars. I know that they're making billions and billions of dollars off of us. This is wrong while they use our loved ones in that warehouse for slaves, the slave labor. They've reduced them now to digging their own graves, making their own coffins, and bottling a hand sanitizer that says, up New York, thank you, Governor Cuomo, but they cannot use that. You know, we are told to cover our faces with a bandana. This is a bandana. In prison, this is what they're told to cover their face with. You Thank can't you. you can't cover anything with that. My daughter says that they just instituted having them to wear masks. And they're taking people out, but they're not telling you where they're taking them. We don't know if they're at the hospital or what. My life depends on freeing our elders. And I've said that on no uncertain terms. I believe that wholeheartedly. I feel like I will not rest based on my executive director, Jose Saldana, whom you, I Donna. love dearly, that we are not free until we all are free. So free right. Maria, free the elderly, free them all. Thank you so much for this time. Allow me to speak tonight. Everyone stay well, be blessed. That's right, blessings. Yes. Thank you, Donna Robinson. That was great. Um, our next speaker, is going to be Maya X. Maya X is a spoken word artist and activist, longtime member of Workers World Party, and a revolutionary student. Take it away, Maya. Greetings, comrades and allies all across the globe, behind the wall, and in the streets. I extend gratitude to the ancestors and liberation warriors who have and continue to rise up and resist against the colonial and imperial beast. Today, we collectively send forward a full power 66 Earth Strong salute to Mumia Abu Jamal, Panther, husband, father, grandfather, journalist, teacher, and revolutionary internationalist. I was born and raised in Jamaica as a Rastafarian by my father and others. As a younger revolutionary student, I recall listening to Mumia's interview with Bob Marley, one of their contemporaries. Rastafari emerged in the 1930s, anchored by the teachings of Marcus Garvey. Our struggle for liberation, self-determination, and reparations is inextricable and ever-present. Via our numerous acts of 
global defiance and solidarity. For example, the reggae band Steel Pulse's timeful tribute to George Jackson on the song, George Jackson's Soledad Brother. While summer taught the apple falls from the tree, the village taught me the apple is the tree, which is the root and there is no separation. As the children in Philly and New Jersey and the Cubs that Chairman Fred Jr. often speaks of, we stand united in the struggle to dismantle and crush colonialism and imperialism in all of its forms. In April 1963, Prime Minister Alexander Bustamante ordered the police to bring all the Rastas, dead or alive. Rastafarians were rounded up, killed, burnt, beat, prosecuted, locks were shaved, some were hung and terrorized. Similar to Mumia, MOVE, indigenous nations and others around the globe, our struggle for liberation rages on by any and all means necessary. Subcomandante Marcos of the Zapatistas and EZLN wrote in a letter to you, Mumia, we extend this long bridge which goes from the mountains of the Mexican Southeast to the prisons of Pennsylvania. I leave the comrades with brick by brick, wall by wall. We know the call, free them all. Ubuntu to Yuhuru. Thank you. Thank you, Maya X, for a powerful message. So I'm gonna be jumping off and passing the baton to uh, a very special gentleman and scholar uh, the one and only Mike Africa Jr. Mike is the son of Mike Sr. and Debbie Africa, who are both falsely imprisoned and have served almost 40 years in prison each, and they have both recently been released in the past two years. Mike is a ray of light that continues his parents' struggle and fight to free Mumia Abu Jamal. So we say happy birthday, free Mumia, free Amal, free Amal for public health, and long live revolution. Long live revolution. Thank you, Santi, for that introduction. That's right. My name is Mike Africa Jr. As Santi said, I'm a member of the MOVE organization and the Seed of Wisdom Foundation. And um, yes, I want to give a warm happy birthday to my brother, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, we trying to make it so that he don't spend another birthday in that prison. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we've gotten a lot of, of our brothers and sisters out of the prisons. Uh, you know, people like um, Sekou Odinga and Herman Bell and Oscar Lopez Rivera, and we got to get Mumia out and, and add him to that list of the people that's been freed. Um, so <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to move on to the next portion of the event and introduce my brother, Mark Lamont Hill. So Mark Lamont Hill is an academic television personality, author, activist. Mark leaves a powerful legacy and his, and his candid conversation with Mumia, with Mumia in the book, The Classroom to the Cell, Conversations on Black Life in America. Mark Lamont Hill. Free the land. Free the land. It is, uh, it's such an honor to be here tonight, you know, being surrounded by so many brilliant thinkers and courageous uh, activists uh, to be here with, you know, freedom fighters who have been long distance runners with political prisoners who have, uh, made the ultimate sacrifice, uh, giving their, ult their, their very bodies to this struggle. And tonight, uh, what brings us together, of course, one of those things is the 66th birthday of our dear brother, Mumia Abu-Jamal, uh, one of the great freedom fighters, one of the great truth tellers uh, that we've ever seen, and a political prisoner, no doubt. Since 1981, we've been battling and fighting and struggling to liberate Mumia. Mumia is such a passionate voice, such a courageous voice. We need him, as my brother Mike said, so desperately on the other side of the dungeon. And we're going to continue to fight until we do so. But if anybody knows Mumia, they know that Mumia wouldn't want us here talking about him. Mumia would want us talking about his case, but he'd also want us to put his case in the context of everybody else. Mumia is being held under the most absurd and violent and ugly circumstances that we've seen. Just last week, uh, people received a phone call saying that he had been taken to the, the, the hospital with COVID-19, making us think that he'd been given a death sentence. That's the type of cruelty and the type of evil uh, that the prison industry and that the prison specifically targeted toward Mumia Abu-Jamal demonstrates every single day. But as I said, it's not just about Mumia, because right now we are in a human rights crisis, uh, a crisis of, of, of carcerality, a crisis of mass incarceration. The American empire 
feeds it off of mass incarceration. Ever since the slave uh, enterprise in America, ever since African people were brought here and enslaved, America has made its money, it has built its empire, it has expanded its economy off of human captivity. And even as we moved into a post-slavery moment, all we did was shift the means of captivity. Now, instead of putting people on plantations, we have people caged in what we call correctional facilities, what we call jails and prisons and, 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 and juvenile facilities and such. We continue to contradict, to take all of our contradictions as a nation and put them behind bars, whether it's mental illness, whether it's poverty, whether it's homelessness, whether it's drug addiction, and of course, political dissent. Anyone who dares speak out against this empire ends up in a cage. That's why Mumia Abu-Jamal was in a cage. That's why we have Sekou Odinga, who was in a cage. That's why we had Herman Bell, who was in a cage. That's why we continue to have everybody from here and around the globe caged when they have the audacity to speak out against empire. So we call for the release of all political prisoners right now because it is the right thing to do. But we also make a, a bolder call, a more radical call, and that is uh, uh, the abolition of prison itself. We must move into a moment that no longer uses the prison as the resolution to our social contradiction. The prison must no longer be our resolution to harm that is done. Our prison, the prison must no longer be uh, the resolution to all of our challenges in society. We must call for the end of prison construction right now. We must call for decarceration. That means we must begin to let people out of prison immediately. We must call for excarceration. That means we have to stop putting people in prison. That means we have to legalize things. It means we have to dismantle laws that criminalize. We have to decriminalize and get rid of this logic of criminalization. We must engage. We must think about restraint of the few. We must think about how we can protect society from harm that is done, but outside the logic of the prison. And we must build a caring community. That is to say, we must develop the resources and the infrastructure. We must find ways to protect those who are vulnerable. We must find ways to invest in those who have not been invested in. We must find ways to food, to provide food, clothing, and shelter for every single person. That's what this is about. That's what abolition is about. But at this moment, we not only have the long-term abolition goal, but we need to exercise the abolitionist principles right now because COVID-19 has created a human rights crisis that amplifies the already existing human rights crisis. To live in an American prison right now is to live with a death sentence. Whether you're there for three months or six months or whether you've gotten a life sentence, you are on death row right now if you are in an American prison. The type of social distancing that the best medical experts, not the president, but the best medical experts suggest can't be exercised in prison. The type of protections, as Sister Donna said, that you want to be able to engage in, you can't in prison. So as anybody who is incarcerated right now doesn't even have the means to defend themselves, what they are getting is cruel and unusual punishment. The, the most dangerous areas of the world right now have infection rates around one and two out of a thousand. Then you, then you go into Rikers Island in New York, and now you got 54 out of a thousand. Can you imagine being anywhere in the world where 54 out of a thousand people are, are, are the infection rate, and we not see it as a human rights crisis? Well, unless it's poor people, unless it's black people, unless it's brown people, unless it's That's right. Hey, hey, Mark. Guess what? We got Rashid, Rashid, brother Rashid Johnson on the phone. Important. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you, bro. You're a political prisoner. Free the land. Free the land. Free Mumia. That's right. Is, it, is, is Brother Rashid Johnson on the phone? Uh, sorry. Uh, Rashid got cut off. I'm waiting for him to call again. I, I don't know if he will. He got cut off. Okay. I, um, I'll have to right. wait for him to call when again. When he calls back, please again. inform us. Thank you, Victor. Um, next, we're going to go to... Russell Maroon Schultz Jr. Uh, Russell is the son of political prisoner Russell Maroon Schultz. Um, Russell Maroon Schultz Jr. is a community activist from Philadelphia. He is a founding member of the Black Unity Council, former member of the Black Panther Party and soldier for the Black Liberation Army. Um, Russell Schultz is, his father is serving a multiple life sentences as a US held uh, cap, captive political prisoner. Russell, are you with us? I'm with you, brother. Can you hear me? On the move, brother. I'm with you. How are you? How are you, brother? To the people, man. Hey, uh, you know, I'm just really thankful, first and foremost, and proud of all of the work that was done to bring us together. Thank all of the comrades. Thank those known and unknown who uh, put this together. And this is uh, just the beginning, but what is needed in the level of work um, that I think we're, we're, we're about 
to see. Um, and so uh, just a quick update on my father. Uh, my father has stage four cancer. Um, uh, he's, he's in there with folks with, you know, uh, symptoms or what have you. He had uh, a situation with his release where he was always guaranteed a single cell. And now that situation has eroded, even though he's in a uh, health facility. Um, but um, his spirits are up, um, he's fighting, and, you know, he would say, you know, to us, you know, in these moments, be strong, you know, be strategic, you know, stay open. Uh, obviously, use this as an opportunity. Um, with your strategies, be healthy, obviously. You know, um, use your immune system as a weapon there. So things have been weaponized and, you know, we always um, use our immune system as weapons. That's something that me and Mia and um, uh, others uh, uh, in the struggle for uh, humanity have kind of always pushed. And so we want to continue to push that. We want to we want to push also whatever ways of calm, you know, you meditate, you work out, whatever it is. Um, you know, I want to push things like folks who are doing the farm work for us, like Co-op Jackson and, and Monarch in Philly, um, uh, all of, also the other side of that strategically, which is, you know, our black tech folks who need the support, you know, um, and then there were people in Philly who passed like Bob from Gold Coast and Mama Kosawa, and we want to just make sure those ancestors who supported Mumia you know, um, are, are, are recognized in this moment. And we know that those people too, possibly in this stressful situation where people get sick, um, are being counted in these numbers, you know, and that's a thing that we can't control anything like that. But this is a, a golden opportunity for us to build solidarity as we're going today. And, and this will be in ways that um, have never been experienced in humankind. So let's build that solidarity for our political prisoners that we haven't had before. This is that opportunity. This is the kickoff. I appreciate everyone who has, you know, come together to play all these great minds. Let's do it again. Let's That's do it right. Let's do it. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Russell. All right, brother. So we're going to next go to brother Sekou Odinga. <laughs> um, member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation, and he is a Black Liberation soldier, prisoner of the white empire. We know what it means to have a birthday in a cage, but every birthday is a kind of victory. So is uh, brother Sekou Odinga with us? How are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Assalamu alaikum. Free the land. Free the land. On the move. The On the move. All power to the people. All power to the people. Yeah. My name so, is Sekou Dulo Odinga. I'm a representative of the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition. I'm also a former political prisoner of war. I've been home now for some five and a half months. Yeah. Uh, five and a half years, excuse me. Uh, I'm honored to be here among so many other great folks to speak about political prisoners. Let me start out by saying happy birthday to my brother Abu Abu Mumia Abu Jamal. Uh, we go way back. I don't know if he remembered me when I was underground in Philadelphia, but I, I met him years ago. You know, uh, with with his with one of his leaders, uh, Reggie Shell. But anyhow, I think it's important that we realize that without our help, some of, if not all of our political prisoners will die in prison. We, we have to, I doubt if that's something that most of us haven't already heard or know. So the question becomes, well, what are we going to do about it? I heard Brother uh, Ruff. Russell, Russell uh, Schultz just talking about solidarity. And I think this is a great uh, example of solidarity that where we could all come together and speak about the things that are on our minds and wish brother
brother uh, Mumia a happy birthday. But uh, we have to do something else. We have to do a little more. We need to really come together in solidarity. Uh, the best resources that we have access to is people power. We need to commit to unifying and organizing the power of the people. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who already support freeing political prisoners and prisoners of war. We have to find a way to unify and organize ourselves to speak and to demand collectively the release of our political prisoners. All the people, all the political prisoner organizations, groups, committees, individuals need to come together under one banner to demand the real to demand the release of our political prisoners. Maybe like something like the Jericho movement or or if we can't all agree on one group, one movement, maybe we can come come together and organize ourselves and come up with something that we can all agree on. Uh, anyhow, we we just have to we just have to come together and do more than just talk. Talk just is not enough. We need to do more. If we don't, we're we're dropping the gun. We're dropping the the banner for our political prisoners. That's right, brother. Thank you for that message. I appreciate you. I, we but let me just say this here that all the talk about these these governors talking about releasing nonviolent prisoners. We can't allow them to take the narrative and, and, and decide how we can struggle. We have a right to struggle by any and all means. And we can't consider our political prisoners criminals if they had if they took the battlefield. That's not that don't make them a criminal, that make them a hero. Thank you for that message. Um, we're now going to go to Oscar, a message from Oscar Lopez Rivera. Oscar Lopez is one of the longest held political prisoners and still fights to this day for the liberation of his beloved Puerto Rico. We have a message from Oscar Lo Lopez Rivera. And before we start, can I just say that he emailed us this morning saying that there is a curfew now in Puerto Rico, which is why he was not able to go to his office to film um, this live to join the Zoom call. Okay, we know that Puerto Rico is definitely experiencing um, still feeling the effects of the, the of the hurricanes that happened, but they're also still feeling the effects of Agent Trump. So um, we do have problems there with that too, but we're delighted to get this message from Oscar Lopez Rivera. Bueno, uh, una de las cosas bien importantes en este mundo, y especialmente cuando estamos presos y cuando vemos que casi todas las puertas se cierran, es bien importante también entender que es el imperio y el imperialismo en sí que nos ha llevado hasta, hasta, este, hasta este momento en, esa, en ese camino. Y es bien importante también recordar que no podemos permitir que el imperio eh, continúe haciendo de nosotros lo que ha hecho hasta ahora. Muchas veces eh, pensamos que hemos logrado algo y sin embargo, de momento pasa algo y ahí está el enemigo de nuevo. ¿no? Y estamos bien eh, claro que a menos que no luchemos por cambiar ese sistema imperialista, no vamos a llegar muy lejos. Y también estar consciente, ser consciente que cuando hay prisioneros políticos, son ellos y ellos las que van a pagar el precio más alto. Y que tenemos que estar ahí para defenderlos, tenemos que estar ahí para protegerlos, tenemos que estar ahí para apoyarlos. Y muchas veces pues sabemos que en algunos casos ya en el pasado compañeros no han salido con vida de la prisión y no, no puedo permitir que el imperio uh, se salga con algo tan tan horroroso, tan doloroso como es que un ser humano muera en una prisión. Pero creo yo que tenemos que ir adelantándonos 
Oh, wow. Thank you for that message. Um, for all of the people that can actually speak Spanish, I'm sure you enjoy it more than I did, but because I can't speak Spanish. But um, so I guess uh, this is the end of my segment here, and we're going. I'm going to give it back to Johanna. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for uh, uh, letting me be on this, and I enjoy any time that we can unite as a people to help free our brother Mubi Abu Jamal. Um, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Johanna Fernandez. All right. Uh, I was trying to translate the words of uh, Oscar Lopez Rivera, and he was saying that we can't allow empire to do what it will with us that we have to resist empire and we cannot allow empire to, um, to essentially let people die in prison. He's saying that there is a crisis of incarceration in the United States and across the world. In this COVID-19 moment, people are being sent to their deaths. Uh, the state is weaponizing health and we must stand up uh, against empire. We are going to move on now, I believe, to Mexico. Is that correct? We're moving on to Mexico, and we have with us Carolina Saldaña, who works with the collective Amigos de Mumia and Mexico, doing translations, helping to organize events and actions for the freedom of Mumia and other political prisoners. Such a pleasure to be here, and I really want to thank you for the invitation. It's, it's an honor for me to be here with all these people who are putting the freedom of political prisoners at the top of their list. And above all, want to say happy birthday, Mumia. Feliz cumpleaños. Gracias for everything you uh, give us day after day, year after 38 years uh, in those horrible prisons in the United States. And um, well, we want to talk about getting our political prisoners out. And first, I think it might be good to just uh, note a little bit of history that um, a lot of people here, probably most people here have some idea of how these political prisoners got there. But there's million people, millions of people in the world who don't have the slightest idea. So let's go back briefly to the days when Marcus Garvey organized the United Negro Improvement Association in Jamaica and the United States from 1970. 1917 to around 1924. He had 4 million people, 4 million, who were ready to leave white supremacist violence behind. And on those days, the young J. Edgar Hoover was charged with the surveillance and destruction of this Pan-Africanist movement. And he never forgot Garvey's power to inspire and mobilize people. Half a century later, when a new black liberation movement was born, he did everything in his power to prevent the rise of a black messiah. Hoover headed up COINTELPRO, the FBI's program of state terror that filled United States prisons with thousands of people, activists, guerrillas. Those people included members of the black and new African liberation movement who were struggling for land and liberty, freedom from slavery and justice. And many are still there in a country that doesn't even recognize that political prisoners exist. So today we want to say free Mumia Abu Jamal today on his birthday. Free Mutulu Shakur, Jaulilu Muntakim, Imam Jamil Alamin, Russell Maroon Schultz, Sundiata Akoli, Veranza Bowers, Kamal Sadiki, Jojo Bowen, Chip Fitzgerald, Fred Muhammad Burton, Kojo, and Ed Poindexter, free David Gilbert, free Leonard Peltier. Their lives are at risk every single day they spend in the world's most lethal prison system. It's clear that the authorities want them to die there. That's their plan. And I just want to mention uh, that um, on August 21st, 2018, the Palestinian political prisoner Ahmad Sadat sent out this message. He said, we write today as imprisoned Palestinians of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, held in Israeli jails for our participation in the struggle for the liberation of our land and people from colonialism and occupation. 
we extend a special revolutionary salute to the imprisoned strugglers of the Black Liberation Movement and other liberation movements, including Mumia Abu Jamal, whose consistent internationalism and principle struggle is known and resonates around the world. We demand the freedom of these freedom fighters in US jails, from Leonard Peltier to Matul Shakur. We know from our experience that it is through struggle and confrontation that true freedom can be realized. So now we have some idea of what we can do from, from Ahmed Sadat, from Sekou Odinga, from others that have spoken today. So let's do it. Thank you so very much, Carolina. Carolina is our fierce organizer in uh, Mexico. She's been with the movement uh, to free political prisoners and to free Mumia Abu Jamal for many decades. And uh, we, we thank her for uh, the solidarity she brings um, to this movement. We're gonna move on to Estela Vasquez. Estela Vasquez is a fierce, woman warrior, uh, a member, a leading member of Local 1199, the Health and Hospitals Union that is at the forefront of the struggle against COVID-19, the members of her union, and we are happy to welcome uh, a leader of a union at a moment when working class people are regaining a sense of their power as workers. It's, it's something uh, brilliant and new uh, in this moment, and we welcome you, Estela. Buenas noches, Johanna. Can you Buenas hear me? Buenas noches, sí, la oímos. <laughs> Gracias, and uh, thank you, sisters and brothers, to each and every one of you on, on the telephone line. Um, I want to uh, rephrase, the, rephrase this by opening and saying that today is Mumia's birthday but it is also the 55th anniversary of a popular uprising in the Dominican Republic in 1965 that was crushed by 10, over 40,000 U.S. Marines. So Mumia, on today, we celebrate your birthday. We remember the struggle and the sacrifice that the Dominican people made in 1965 and we say the struggle continues, a luta continua from the trenches where our members are, which is in every hospital, nursing home, home care in New York City. We raise our voices to see free Mumia, free them all, free all political prisoners, and we will win. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and the honor to share our working class message of solidarity with Mumia and with all the sisters and brothers that are on the phone. The struggle continue, palante. Palante. Muchísimas gracias, Estela. And the struggle. Gracias. And the struggle against U.S. empire in the Dominican Republic is the same one as the struggle for freedom in Palestine and for freedom in Puerto Rico and to free political prisoners and to abolish prisons domestically, but also to uphold the people at the bottom of society, the working class. Uh, we are gonna now move on to a very special human being, Fred Hampton Jr., who doesn't really need an introduction. He's the fierce voice of resistance carrying on the torch of his father, Fred Hampton, the chairman of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, who was assassinated by COINTELPRO in 1969. Chairman Fred, welcome. Revolutionary, revolutionary love, respect, and appreciation. Please give salute to all those online with us, uh, to our hosts, uh, to those who are not online with us, to all, to all those who are held captive in the concentration camps internationally. Um, we say, uh, 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 it hurts that Mumia uh, uh, Abu Jamal's birthday, that we, that he's still not in, uh, out in the community, but we, 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 we still press him hard with our, our demand. We, we got to say it so, so loud, so strong that Mumia himself here is free Mumia Abu Jamal, free him all. We got to make the connection from the infamous Cook County Jail here in Chicago, 
to those to the concentration camps again throughout the world. Contrary to what um, U.S. President Donald Trump and other representatives of the ruling class have positioned that this is not a time for politics, we differ with that. Obviously, this, this, this is definitely, in, in fact, we say everything is political, and this is in time that we intensify and recognize that everything is political, and in particular, that of our political prisoners. Again, that of our political prisoners. This climate of COVID-19, a.k.a. Uh, coronavirus, is a capitalism on steroids. It is capitalism on steroids. The contradiction that we have been, the contradictions that we have been dealing with day to day throughout the colonized communities, uh, from what's happening uh, from the, the, the rapid police terrorism to the we don't care healthcare, uh, we are witnessing in the raw. It is a, it is terrible. What is fine, as Chairman Mao Zedong said, even the most individuals who attempt to take an apolitical position, the state. Uh, not from a horse's mouth, but from a pig's mouth. They're making it very clear. With, with, with the, with, they, they have, they have always had. And they, this, in this stage in the game, when people are recognizing this field marshal George Jackson said, "There are no guarantee tomorrows. We must, we must relate to what Malcolm X said. We have nothing to lose except our chains. We got, we, and, and, and I don't want to sound macabre, but every day it is demoralizing, it's depressing to hear about the continuous death." That we are experiencing the outside community, those in the, in, in, inside the, the concentration camps. I have this Claude McClay, this Claude McKay said, if we are to die, let us not die like dogs. Let us, let us fight. Let us, again, keep, the, keep, 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 keep mobilizing. We have to be innovative with our tactics. We, they, uh, we, don't, we cannot deal with absolutes. I mean, we, we recognize we have to be scientific. We have to be strategic. Uh, people talking about this social distancing. Let us let's push for state distancing. Let we uh, make the state back up from us, back up our political prisoners. So we again, we, we have to have caravan cars. We have to use tactics such as this technology to keep going. We cannot afford the luxury to sit back and say, okay, well we can't struggle. Do not do it out of the loops. We must be ever developing, ever developing with our tactics. Again, I'm honored. I'm honored to be here. And if we had a doubt, let us not let us not die like dogs. Let us continue to fight. Free will be out with you all. Free them all. All right. Uh, I think we got we got the we got Kathy Boudin. I got her on the line. She walked away from her desk, but she's here. Uh, she's here to take the stage, the virtual stage. Kathy Boudin is a former political prisoner, professor of social work at Columbia University, the co-director and co-founder of the Center for Justice at Columbia University. Her work focuses on the causes and consequences of mass incarceration and the development of strategies to both transform the current criminal justice system and to deal with the day-to-day -day damage that the system has caused. I want to welcome Kathy. I'm honored that she is with us. She is the woman who has single-handedly uh, created a powerful conference it, uh, in New York City uh, behind the bars um, that amplifies the voices of the incarcerated. Kathy, welcome to the teaching. Thank you so much. I am so happy to have been invited to, to celebrate Mumia and also to be here with so many other people who are committed to social change. Uh, and I think that we, we celebrate Mumia because of his life on how to resist. And uh, I don't know, giving us leadership and how to be uh, an incarcerated person or, or prisoner. Um, I think that... Did we lose Kathy? Looks like Kathy dropped. We were doing so well. But we're gonna keep it. We're gonna keep up the fight. I'm gonna bring to the stage, to the virtual stage, uh, VJ Prashad in a moment. But I want to, as we draw to a close, I want to raise up uh, the names of all of the people who have worked tirelessly to bring so many people together and to put this uh, event um, on this evening virtually. Uh, Malav. Malav of Common Notions, Malav Kanuga, is uh, a fierce revolutionary professor. Um, he is a person who identified that Mumia Abu Jamal's uh, book, We Want Freedom, had gone out of print and immediately uh, put that back on. And we now have We Want Freedom, one of the best books written by Mumia on his life in the Black Panther Party. 
Betsy Piet, Sophia, Pam Africa, uh, Santiago, uh, Mike Africa, um, I'm going to miss people, Miguel, um, who's been uh, helping us out. Um, I'm going to forget people, but it took a village to put this show together. Uh, we were inspired by the fact that in the 1990s, the movement to free Mumia was one of the first movements to use email and the internet to build a movement. And this is our contribution and our gift to this revolutionary moment, to this moment of contradictions in which capitalism um, is showing its, its horror and its terror and its disregard um, for the environment, for human life, for workers, for doctors, for nurses. Um, so we just wanna thank everyone who contributed to this, to this very complicated process. Do we have, um, do we yeah. have Kathy on the line? Kathy, yeah. continue. I work with students at the university and faculty who have never heard the term, they don't know what a political prisoner is. And I think part of our work is to be organizing and educating people about the history of the resistance and the role of political prisoners in playing the this, this central part of it. I think that uh, we also know that simply telling the history is not adequate and that we have to create opportunities for being activists in the struggle. As Mumia has said, it's through that activism and that expression of solidarity that people grow politically and become part of a larger movement for change. So I work with RAP, who's Laura Whitehorn and Donna, Donna Robinson have already talked a great deal about it. But I think that what's important is that RAP is a grassroots movement in which is offering opportunities for people, including the students with whom I work, as well as faculty, to play a role directly as activists in the change. And recently there were demonstrations and protests in front of a number of prisons, ask, demanding that Cuomo release people who are elderly, people who have been in prison for violent crimes, as well as nonviolent, because we know that the, the movement largely, ex the movement and, and, and the, the narrative and, and the policies largely exclude people who've been convicted of violent crimes. Uh, and one of the women that participated in front of a prison said, you know, being here, it lit a fire under me. I want to do more. And that's about the connection between people working in universities and people in the community to be able to build this kind of a movement. When I was in prison, uh, Mumia was a tremendous inspiration to me. Why? Because of his resistance, because of his ability to be somebody who, under the most terrible circumstances, continued to keep a vision of what it meant that he had ended up in prison and what he was going to do at that time. I wrote this poem in 1994 when Governor Pataki was elected uh, governor of New York and, and was committed in his campaign to reinstitute the death penalty, which he did. And I said, Mumia, I wonder what you do with fear. Do you give it space to float between the shadows of the bars crisscrossing lines on mouse gray cinder blocks? In the mustard yellow lights, does it change into moving shapes of ghosts and pale green masks? I imagine that you let fear flow like tears to wash away the salt it brings. I wonder how you plant your hope. Do you walk in fields of dreams or find it in the magic of a spider's web in the ceiling corner of your cell, in the constancy of seasons, in the tenderness that somehow survives? I wonder how you grow your life in a row they call death. Is it true not enough hours in the day exist to write all the articles in your mind, that sleep takes you away from finding legal points to save the lives of others on your tear, that life is full when you are full of life? I wonder what your lessons are for those of us who now await New York's first execution. It never happened because people mobilized. I think that what we learned about from Mumia and why we're so celebrating is that Mumia is somebody who has been able to both immerse himself inside the actual reality of life that he's living in prison. And at the same time, he is able to continually work to define the larger system so that we know that within this a moment of crisis of the COVID, we are not just fighting with the COVID crisis, we're fighting to restructure the entire system that we live in. And that COVID is just a metaphor for something much, much larger. And Mumia has taught us about maintaining that vision. Before I end, I wanna say that that poem was dedicated to Mumia and it was dedicated to David Gilbert 
my lifelong partner and father of my child, and dedicated to all political prisoners who led their, led their lives, committed to changing our society. And that's what we're doing now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy, for that powerful message and for those beautiful poetic words. Um, it is an honor to work uh, in the movement to free political prisoners. The people who are committed to freeing political prisoners are ultimately revolutionaries. Um, and it is my honor to welcome now to the virtual stage, Vijay Prashad, my comrade and colleague um, whom I love. Uh, Vijay Prashad is an Indian historian and journalist, director of Tri-Continental, chief editor of Leftward Books. He is the author uh, and editor of several books, including The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. Above all, he's a revolutionary, unrepentant, and a fighter for a different world. Vijay, it's my honor to welcome you. Thanks a lot, Joanna. It's great to be with you. And you know, I'm, I'm holding your book in my hand, uh, one of the finest books uh, edited of Mumia's writings. Our comrade Mumia, the freest man in the United States of America. We are in Corona shock. The bourgeois order has become a prison. We are in what the IMF calls the great lockdown. About 3 billion workers are without enough work to survive. That's about 81% of the global workforce. The workers will lose about $3.5 trillion in income. Many families of the working class are already starving. The trauma is deep and cutting. The governments of the bourgeois order flail about. Their champions like Trump and Bolsonaro basing their decisions on the hallucinations of fantasy rather than the cold, hard facts of science. The world is experiencing house arrest. The bourgeois order has turned its prisons into death chambers where COVID-19 spreads as rapidly as on cruise ships. It has turned each home into a cell. Meanwhile, in the socialist world, from China to Vietnam, from Kerala to Cuba, the communist movements have promoted public action and science-based policy, have used the full powers of the state to use reason, to design policies to isolate those who've been infected and to quarantine those who've been in touch with them. They have used humanitarian values to feed people and to hastily decommodify as many aspects of life as possible. Neighborhood groups in China and cooperative movements in Kerala, people's doctors in Cuba and community groups in Vietnam have shown that in these socialistic societies, the people are not treated as objects of the state and of the free market, but are confident and active, organized to participate when an emergency strikes society. A straight and powerful line has now been drawn between the project of the bourgeois order and the project of the socialist order. And the former, for all its wealth, has been found lacking in humanity. On the 6th of April, Mumia wrote that COVID-19 shows us that the United States government is a weapon of mass incompetence. The US government, he said, had months to prepare for the coming of the coronavirus. They treated it lightly, and nearly a 1,000 deaths a day proved that the virus is indeed deadly serious. What Mumia said then is totally accurate. On the 31st of December 2019, George Gao, the head of China CDC, called the US CDC and informed them about the lethality of the virus. A few days later, Gao spoke to the head of US CDC and burst into tears. On the 3rd of January, the head of US CDC informed the Department of Health and Human Services, whose head, Alex Azar, refused to tell Trump about the situation for two weeks. On the 28th of January, Azar said that Americans would find that the virus should not be an impact on their day-to-day -day life. On the 30th of January, the World Health Organization declared a public emergency. That day, that very day, Trump said, we think we have it well under control. The government didn't clear labs to conduct testing until the 29th of February, an entire month later. This has had catastrophic impacts for the abilities of local governments 
to do contact testing and to manage the spread of this very dangerous disease. Right through January, February, and March, Trump minimized the threat. His Twitter feed provides all the necessary evidence. On the 9th of March, Trump likened the virus to the common flu. Think about that, he wrote callously. Mm -hmm. Two days later, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. On the 13th of March, Trump declared a national emergency. This was six weeks after the World Health Organization had declared its own public emergency. These six weeks that the weapon of mass incompetence, the US government lost the American people. The US government, a weapon of mass incompetence, then turns the full weight of its propaganda machinery to attack China. The weight of that propaganda machine fell heavily on a population that has been imprisoned by bourgeois ideology. Why do I always say that Mumia is the freest man in the United States of America? Because he saw the Kool-Aid and he refused to drink it. Happy birthday, comrade Mumia, age 66 today, having spent 39 years of all your years in prison. Red salute to you. Woo. Thank you very much, Vijay. Someone just texted me, come through Vijay Prashad, come through, you're coming through. I want to, before we call to the virtual stage, our final speaker, I want to uh, acknowledge the folks who made this a possibility properly. And we're going to bring all of the hosts to the stage in a minute. Uh, but these are the folks who, who brought it home with this very complex event with so many people. Okay, Betsy Piet, this is very important. This events like these require a village to pull together. Betsy Piet, Gabe Bryant, Tova Fry, Ash Go, Josh Carrera, Malap Kanuga, Miguel, Joe Piet, Santiago, uh, Santiago Alvarez and Sophia Williams, Pam Africa, of course, who's been on us and on it uh, for the past uh, many, many, many years, decades. The entire movement to bring Mumia home, um, we came together about a month ago and uh, it was clear to us that this is truly a movement for uh, complete and total transformation of society. And we thought that we would open it up um, to all to speak on the crisis of political imprisonment, but also on the struggles that, that political prisoners fought uh, over the last 50, 60 years and throughout history. Um, and I can think of no better person to bring to the stage to discuss this matter than Angela Davis, uh, my hero. Distinguished Professor Emerita is known internationally for her ongoing work to combat all forms of oppression in the US and, ab and abroad. Over the years, she has been active as a student, teacher, writer, scholar, and activist organizer. She is a living witness to the historical struggles of the contemporary era. I will say that um, she is the person who single-handedly with many others, but through her vision and writings pretty early on, on incarceration and abolition has helped mainstream um, this profound concept, but has also helped along with her colleagues um, and, and the activists she's worked with in California and beyond, she's made popular um, this term that everybody around the world uses now, the prison industrial complex. She is um, the embodiment of commitment and long-term struggle. Uh, she is the embodiment of, of love and and she's a person that we all look up to um, and we love her. And we are just honored that she is with us today. I will just say one thing that she said that 
I repeat over and over again, the reason why imprisonment captures the imagination and is so significant is because it raises questions about the organization of society. Do we want to throw people away or do we want to address social problems differently? Without further ado, Angela Davis. Um, thank you so much, uh, Johanna. You are too generous. I am deeply honored to have been invited to participate in this teaching alongside um, Kathy uh, Vijay and so many other distinguished activists and formerly incarcerated people who have come together on Mumia's birthday in the midst of this current crisis to remind ourselves and to remind the world uh, that we need to energetically reactivate our struggles to free political prisoners and to abolish the prison industrial complex. For so many years, Mumia has been a mighty beacon, illuminating the conditions surrounding his own incarceration, even as he has primarily focused on the situation of others and on the national and global context of racial capitalism, of authoritarian repression, and of the militarism that has not only produced war, but has also influenced policing practices in our communities. Although he has been behind bars for more than half of his own life, Mumia has been an indispensable leader for so many of us who live our lives in this uh, so-called free world. So happy birthday, Mumia, we all love you. What I've always appreciated about Mumia is that he never allows himself to remain ensconced in the past or the present even. He always directs his vision and ours toward the future. And so every year around this time, around his birthday, we are called upon to renew our commitment, not only to help liberate Mumia, but also to begin to create future worlds that will have been released from the tyrannies of racism, uh, um, capitalist exploitation, um, the prison industrial, complex, heteropatriarchy, war. Mumia's birthday always reminds us of how far we have to go. Uh, we think about who has been liberated, who still requires our activist practices of speaking truth to power and generating hope for the future. And so let me say that I'm so happy to join all of those who are celebrating the release of Delbert Africa. And when Chuck Africa was released some days later, that marked the uh, release of the very uh, last uh, incarcerated uh, MOVE member. And so for this, I want to congratulate Pam and Ramona and all of those who have dedicated their lives to securing the freedom of the move nine. And so now we definitely have to free Mumia. And we have to free Leonard Peltier. And then there's Romaine Fitzgerald and Veronza Bowers, Ed Poindexter, and all the others who have been mentioned and those who have not been mentioned. Um, I'm speaking. Uh, of members of the Black Panther Party who are still in prison. And there are other political prisoners in US prisons who need to be freed. Uh, my co-defendant, Rochelle McGee, is one of the longest held prisoners in the country. David Gilbert, who is one of our finest anti-imperialist intellectuals, is still behind bars, given the many decades he has spent in prison and given his distinguished work as an organizer inside, he should definitely be released right now. 
But let us also take this opportunity to recognize how important it is to uh, support those uh, beyond the borders of, of the US. And I'm thinking about Kurdish political prisoners, Kurdish women political prisoners uh, in Turkey. I'm thinking about political prisoners in Brazil who have challenged state violence and, and, and like Marielle uh, uh, Franco who have challenged femicide. And I'm of course thinking about political prisoners incarcerated in India. And I'm thinking about uh, political prisoners in Palestine. And of course we recognize that Palestine remains the largest open air prison in the world. And so this means that we should be aware when we call for the release of prisoners, the release of older prisoners uh, and the release of, 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 of of um, a vast number of prisoners who constitutes the uh, imprisoned population of, 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 of the US, uh, they should not be um, released only to be placed under electronic surveillance. Uh, in challenging the prison industrial complex, we also challenge the state's embrace of carcerality uh, more broadly. The current COVID-9 crisis is teaching us that jails and prisons and immigrant detention facilities do not work in this era of globalization. If people are not released from prison, there will be catastrophic consequences. My final words will be the words of Asafa Shakur, words which have echoed all over the country and throughout the world. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you so very much for those powerful words, Angela. And we have uh, Rashid Johnson, a prisoner on the line that we should go to and we only have three minutes. So I'm going to just ask that his mic be turned on and hopefully he can join us. Well, just very quickly, I'd like to extend my revolutionary salute to Mamil on his birthday and state that we do need to continue to fight for his freedom after decades of unlawful and political imprisonment. And just to sum up very quickly what I wanted to say, um, from the dungeons of the future Europe to raising wire plantations of today's capitalist America, Prison has always served a particular political function of containing, suppressing, and discouraging people of color, the poor, and laboring people from resisting the oppressive and exploitative conditions imposed upon us by our class enemies. In fact, alongside the police and military, the role of prisons is an essential aspect of the class nature and exercise of state power. So it is neither accidental nor the product of devious conspiracy that imprisonment in capitalist society is targeted at specific social demographics and poor people. It is therefore an essential component of the struggle against class and racial oppression that all of us unite in struggle against prisons as we, as they exist and operate in capitalist society. This is especially important and relevant in this era of the growing COVID-19 pandemic, where prisons present a particular danger in the spread of this overall pandemic and the greater danger presented to the lives of those in prison who are particularly vulnerable to this virus. So not only must we up the ante in the fight against the injustice of mass incarceration, we must also develop new alliances and methods of struggle and ones geared at seizure and exercise of power by the masses. In the face of these new challenges that the establishment has proven utterly incompetent and incapable of protecting anyone from. And with that, I will conclude with the words, dare to struggle, dare to win, and we should fight for all power to all the people. Thank you so very much, Brother Rashid. We love you. And we must conclude, Thank but you. first, we will say that we have a series of events coming up tomorrow, Saturday, a Mumia Libre dance party on Instagram. Um, and we also have a reading of Mumia's work, but also revolutionary works, which we're calling, uh, which we're calling Poetry in Motion. Uh, thank you so very much. I think that all of our uh, hosts 
should take the stage because this was truly a collective effort. So shall we um, feature Mike Africa, Betsy Santiago, uh, and give them the last word? Uh, sure, thank you, Johanna. I just wanna to say to everyone who participated in this, um, thank you and I appreciate the, the struggle that we're continuing. I, I love to see this. Angela Davis, I really, I, I've seen you speak uh, many times and I just wanna say that you are so inspirational to me and I thank you for your words. It's very motivational and to everyone that spoke, thank you. Free Mumia. Yeah, uh, to Angela, you know, you were an inspiration for me. I was a student in Buffalo uh, back in the 60s and the struggle with George Jackson and, and others motivated me to pay attention to the struggle of prisons. I just also want to shout out that uh, next uh, Thursday is May Day. You know, it is the day uh, we had earlier today, Carl Smalls um, speaking, uh, Chris Smalls, I'm sorry. You know, and there have been over a hundred strikes of workers so far in response to their bosses refusing to provide them for protective equipment against COVID-19. And we're gonna see an increase in this. This is a new century, as Chris said. And we should be looking for May Day events in our cities, whether it's car care vans or teach-ins or whatever it is, be out there to support our working class sisters, brothers, and non-gender conforming comrades. Thank you. Santiago. Yeah. I just want to give thanks. Um, I'm really grateful to be a part of this and give thanks to everybody who spoke and especially all of the elders who are passing on all of this vital information to this younger generation of activists, of revolutionaries. We have so much to learn from you all and we're grateful for all of your lessons. So thank you. And also be sure to tune in tomorrow, the Instagram live, the handle is uh, Bring Mumia Home. And then on Sunday, Poetry in Motion, we're going to be screening this event as well. Again, as long, along with uh, all of Mumia's movies, a ton of his uh, essays, his audio essays, um, and videos, music, art, poetry, that's all been dedicated to Mumia over the past 39 years. So be sure to tune into that. And thank you again. Free Mumia, free them all. We love you, Mumia. Absolutely. If you've enjoyed this moment, if you think that this was powerful, political education, please donate to uh, the movement to bring Mumia home. Um, you can actually go to the Eventbrite page and there are categories there for donating or you can email home at gmail.com. You can go to Common Notions, which was instrumental in bringing this event to fruition. Uh, Malav Kanuga is one of the founders of Common Notions, uh, the production house that published We Want Freedom, uh, A Life in the Black Panther Party by Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, again, email uh, bringmumiahome at gmail.com for more information about how to donate. Betty, do you want to say something? Yeah, mobilizationformumia.com webpage. You can donate there. All of that goes to local work in Philadelphia. So mobilizationformumia.com. There's the freemumia.com page, the Bring Mumia Home page. And I just want to end by thanking everyone who's contributed to this event, all of our speakers. Um, and I just want to reiterate that the moral assignment of our time is to free and liberate the people who civilized American society in the 60s. Um, but those who fought the world over from Turkey to Palestine to Puerto Rico to fight um, in the fight for a new world. And one of the things that the political prisoner movement um, has uh, instilled in me is a commitment to the transformation of society, the fundamental radical transformation yeah. of society, which is uh, what we need more than ever. But as Kathy Boudin said, that transformation must happen on the ground and we have an unprecedented moment before us to uplift the power of workers um, and to demand that they all be freed. This is the moment for abolition and decarceration and upwards and onwards to a different world. Thank you. Freedom all.
Have a great day, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Love you, family. On the move. On a move. On a move. On a move.